It is 10 o'clock. Good morning. I'm Lucas Panzeca from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. The Nashville Predators got on the board early and never trailed in a 6-3 to home win over the St. Louis Blues on Thursday. Philip Forsberg with two goals and an assist, including this empty netter that tied Forsberg's career high and a single-season franchise record with his 43rd goal. McDonough, though, uses that strength to steal the puck. And Philip Forsberg going to seal the game. John Bucci-Gross on the ESPN call. The win snapped a three-game losing skid for the Preds. They head northeast to visit the Islanders on Saturday at 6.30 and the Devils on Sunday at 6 before returning home. In NFL news, the Eagles have agreed to terms with left tackle Jordan Mailata on a three-year, $66 million extension that includes $48 million in guaranteed money. In free agency news, veteran outside linebacker Kyle Van Noy is returning to the Baltimore Ravens on a two-year deal after producing a career-high nine sacks last season. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. All right, we made it. Happy Friday. Welcome into 104.5 The Zone. We got the Preds back on track. Phil Forsberg will be here in just about 18 minutes. We're excited about it. The return of Lucas Panzeca's boss and also the best goal scorer on the Nashville Predators squad this year, as is typically the case. And ever. Phil Forsberg getting it done, and the Preds in dominant fashion last night. So we're looking forward to catching up with him. Uh, how are you going to address him? Because you were very disrespectful last time. Of course, Phil Forsberg, famously not just of the Nashville Predators, but also a part owner of Nashville SC, which in turn makes him the boss of Lucas Panzeca, which delights me. I thought I was very respectful mm, last time around. He didn't seem to think so. Uh, I, I think you should address him as Sir for the Sir Philip. For the entirety of the interview, I think that's how we'll move forward at 1020. Sir Philip has a nice ring to it. 615-737-1045 is the number. If you want to join, we'd be happy to have you. Coach Mack will be here, too, at 1120. Joe Alt was in the Titans facility a couple of days ago. He completed his uh, one of his pre-draft 30 visits. Titans met with him on Wednesday it was reported yesterday, and then he went on to visit the New York Jets, who are just three spots behind the Titans and also desperately need help at tackle. That's who you're trying to stay ahead of. Well, I mean, I don't know if you're trying to stay ahead of them, but... Yes, that's competing. the measuring stick. That's what they're talking about in meeting rooms with Rand Carthon and Brian Callahan. Guys, we got to stay ahead of the Jets. Listen, that's your draft plan. we got to stay ahead of the Jets with the left tackle stuff. You want to get the left tackle over with at seven. You just want to rip the Band-Aid off. You don't, want to, you don't want to slow burn this thing at all. You're scared. You just want the best possible tackle, and that may absolutely be the right decision. But if you want the best possible tackle, the Jets are the team that you have to stay in front of. So, no, I don't know that it's a part of their draft meetings, but I certainly think that that's a part of the discussion. Who is the best tackle prospect? There doesn't seem to be really consensus this year. When you talk to uh, a variety of different analysts, you hear a lot of people talking about Joe Alt, Ola Fashanu, Fawaga. I mean, on down the list. For the most part. Is Graham Barton a tackle or a guard? He's an interior offensive lineman. He got short. He got T-Rex arms, yeah? Um, for the most part, Joe Alt has been considered the number one tackle in this draft. Definitely he's, after the combine. When you found out he was damn near 6'9", he's basically the mountain. And I think there's some... When when Greg did his 3HL, Greg Cosell, famously of NFL Films, when Greg did his 3HL appearance a couple of weeks ago, probably about a month ago, and had some comments about Joe Alt that uh, got picked up here locally because it was just kind of pointing out 
some things that he could stand to improve upon. Did you think people took that too seriously? Because I, I was going back and forth with some people last night on primetime about, is Gre- didn't Greg Cosell say he was out on Joe Alt? And I said, no, that's not how the analysis went down at all. Just basically there's some things that he could stand to clean up that probably weren't being talked about enough. When you're talking about the consensus, probably, or close to consensus, best tackle prospect in the draft. Now, I don't think there's a more, is there a more obvious draft pick and need besides Caleb Williams and the Bears? Is there a more popular pick than Joe Alt to the Titans? A more obvious looking pick than Joe Alt to the Titans? Just mock draft wise? I don't think I could. I, I would struggle to find one that didn't have yeah. Joe Alt going to the Titans. Yeah, I agree with that. There's discussion about. Who is QB2? Is it Jaden Daniels? Is it Drake May? Oh, could it be J.J. McCarthy? But there is no discussion about Caleb Williams 1 and seemingly everybody's on the same page. Joe Alt 7. Well, it's it's just because I don't want to overthink these things just because it's so obvious. (laughs) I mean, we're even trying to do it with Marvin Harrison Jr., right? Like Daniel Jeremiah out there, hey, don't be blindsided if Malik Neighbors is taking over Marvin Harrison when we've spent months, spent months and months talking about Harrison as this generational receiver prospect. But, yeah, I don't think people are really budging on Alt. The thing that Greg pointed out about Joe Alt that got picked up on 3HL is basically, to summarize, that he can be a little wide and late with his hands, right? You want to get into the chest, of a defensive lineman, if you're an offensive lineman, if you're a defensive lineman, you're trying to do the same. You're, try, you're just trying to get the leverage as quickly as humanly possible, and you're trying to pop them first to kind of get them off their off their base. That he's a little late and wide with his hands is not a death sentence for Joe Alt. It's something that you would think Bill Callahan might be able to clean up. So he may go on to be an eight to 10 year perennial pro bowl selection at left tackle. And you just don't have to think about it anymore. And I, I think for the vast majority of Titans fans at this point, given how the off season has gone, it's just kind of like, yeah, I'm good. You can, you can talk about as many draft hypotheticals as you want for the next, what, 20 days until the uh, first round of the NFL draft, 20 days and a couple of hours until they finally get this thing underway. And the Titans are going to be off the board early, theoretically, unless they trade back. I totally get why Titans fans would be sitting here listening to sports talk radio for the next three weeks and be like, whatever, man, just give me the tackle on the 25th and talk to me later. Give me Joe Alt. Breaking Titans news on 104.5 The Zone. We have numbers. We have numbers. Sorry, you were boring me. Uh, Free agent numbers for the Titans, and we have number changes for the Titans. Calvin Ridley will wear zero. Mason Rudolph will wear 11. Chidobia Wuzie will wear 13. Tony Pollard will still wear 20. Legereus Sneed will still wear 38. Among the number changes, Tajay Spears will go to two. And this one, I think will bother Titans fans. Jalen Duncan is switching to 71. Is that a cursed number now? Because for a while, Titans fans didn't want players after Mariota wearing eight, and Will Levis is obviously eight. Square up on the FNM Bank chat says, Jalen Duncan changed to number 71 with a bunch of heartbreak emojis. (laughs) Oh, no, Jalen Duncan, we had hope for you. That news is worth interrupting me from my boring tackle talk. I've been doing the same tackle opener on pre-draft shows a month out for five off seasons, Lucas. I'm fine to be interrupted with it. I think I think that they should retire the number 71. Yes, the first ever What would we call that? Wall of, uh the first ever wall of shame. Wall of shame. Who what oh, this is a fun game. I like this game for a Friday. We should we could do this all show. What numbers need to be on the Titans' wall of shame? I love this game. Because I immediately, I think of 
I think of 10, honest to God. I guess. I just think, I think Titans fans have fond memories of VY. I know it flamed out. Well, it's not just VY. It's, yeah, it's Jake Locker. It's Des Fitzpatrick. There's some ickiness with 10. What about D Hop? Well, he's made that better. <laughs> I don't know. What else, what other numbers belong on the wall of shame? Because 71, I'm with you. What What's Jalen Duncan doing? What was he last year, 79? Yeah, but you also don't want Dennis Daly and Andre Dillard to, I mean, literally, that's just two seasons. <laughs> to have a lasting impression with your franchise to, for the rest of time. Right, to, to tarnish <laughs> the great career of Michael Ruse, who also wore 71. It's two, the two seasons have been that bad, though. Like, they really respect, were. respectfully to Michael Ruse, who deserves all the respect in the world. And I know, I know there's other players for the Titans who have worn 71 and worn it well. But the last two seasons have been absolute hell. And I'm tired of talking about left tackles. Lucas is bored with me rambling on about left tackles to start the show. I'm bored about talking about left tackles for the 1,000th time to start the show, okay? It's enough to make me say just, all right, do it at seven. Enough. Austin Stanley of A to Z Sports texted us and said, D-Hop saved 10. I agree with Austin. D-Hop has saved the number 10. In one season. Yes. So you're alleging that if the two seasons by Dillard and Daly are not bad enough to retire 71, that one season by DeAndre Hopkins is enough to salvage 10. Yes. I'm not, I'm not unwilling to. And to, I don't uh, think VY tarnished the number 10. I don't. I'm I, not, it's not a VY. It's not just a VY thing. So it's just Jake Locker and Des Fitzpatrick for you. Yeah, I think there's a couple others. Uh, also, Ty Zentner is changing to 17. Who? The punter. The punter they brought in for, for Stonehouse. Oh. <laughs> He's changing his number. <laughs> I, I would... He's like, Ty, you want to change it? Yeah, all right. I, I mean, I guess. <laughs> Ryan's going to be back. <laughs> the look that came over my face when Ooh. you said. T- <laughs> See, I told you I'm not ready for off season to start on April the 8th. <laughs> oh, my God. Phil Forsberg's next.
Phil Forsberg going to join us here in just a minute. We'll take some phone calls in the meantime. 615-737-1045. Matt in Lafayette wants to chime in. Hey, Matt. Hey, guys. Uh, yeah, like Brock Bowers, to me, I, I love him, and I would love to get him. Uh, the prospect of trading back, um, you know, to maybe, you know, 12, 13 in that area and getting him with the, you know, the, the – the offensive line as deep as it is in this draft, and we get get a number two, maybe a number, you know, get a number three pick uh, for that drop back, uh, and then getting wide receivers. I just don't know if that makes sense. I don't know. Uh, what do you guys think? Well, it's just it's a hard exercise to do, um, you know, because th- we we go back and forth on this stuff, and I the idea that Brock Bowers would be there in the teens seems unthinkable to me, Lucas. I just too I good. Can, I I He's can't good. imagine that that many teams would say, "Nah, we're good." But football teams do dumb stuff all the time, so maybe. I mean, listen, if you can trade back and he's there late, what's what's the Minnesota pick? 11. I mean, that's if you can pick up Brock Bowers and a tackle. I just don't I don't know if I'm comfortable trading out without it yielding two first-round picks in some form or fashion. But we can get into draft hypotheticals later. Meantime, Preds are getting ready to wrap up their regular season in the next couple of days. They beat the St. Louis Blues 6-3 to three on Thursday at Bridgestone. The arena looked like it was rocking on ESPN+. Plus. In fact, we have some of the ESPN Plus audio, don't we, Lucas? ESPN Plus? It's an ESPN Plus. Well, you think the Preds were just playing like a... D2 basketball game on ESPN Plus. What's wrong with you? They put hockey on ESPN Plus all the time. Play the call, they damn it. They put it on ESPN. Play the Donald call. uses that strength to steal the puck. And Philip Forsberg going to seal the game. Phil, I'm sorry. Did I offend you by saying that you played on ESPN Plus and not ESPN last night? I apologize. No, not at all. Sadly, you're, uh, you're right. So that's uh, ESPN Plus is... Uh, it's, it's a real thing, so we, we appreciate all the, the support from the ESPN crew. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's just one of the first mistakes that Lucas has made because the last time, famously, he is an employee of yours as a Nashville SC radio broadcaster, and he I, he went the entire interview last time without calling you sir. So we can we can make the rules out the gate, Phil. How do you want Lucas to address you for the for the duration of this broadcast? Yeah, no, I, I think, like I said, I, I gave him a, a free a free one, so we're gonna. This will be his test run. We're gonna keep it keep it normal, and then if he uh, if he uh, messes up this one, then we definitely have to take some some action. I'm not confident. Taking notes. I'm not confident. Uh, you guys <laughs> have been on an absolute tear in the last couple of weeks, and I know the the skid um, a, a couple of games ago less than ideal. It seems like you got the power play situation, the special team situation straightened out but for what you and Roman are doing right now and I know it's a team sport and you can give me the humble athlete thing if you want to but the way that you two are playing such kick-ass hockey right now has to mean something special for all the different things that you guys have been through and now on the precipice of uh, clinching another playoff spot yeah no for sure I think both of us are are obviously taking a ton of pride in helping this team move forward and and obviously Yost has been unbelievable during this stretch just by his play on the ice but also just by his leadership the way he drives this team by by his actions has just been remarkable, and, and the stuff that he can do. I mean, we've seen him years and years and years, but I feel like he just keeps getting better and better, and that's inspiring for all of us. And it, it certainly is for me. Just he keeps pushing, pushing the yeah the the level of greatness to to a new level that forces me to keep up with him. And uh, yeah, I don't think that there's a better guy to to look at look after after this in this league. How much fun is that for you guys to be able to work off each other that way? Oh, it, it's great. I think obviously that's that's something that I don't know exactly. I can't speak for him, but that's definitely like I said the way I see it. I mean, he keeps pushing pushing himself to be better, and that's something that I try to do as well all the time. And we have got a bunch of guys, if not every single guy on this team, that feel the same way. And then obviously everyone is in different situations. Uh, but but like I said, I think the mindset is is very similar for for a ton of guys on this team, which is which is the reason why we're starting to to play our best hockey down the stretch and why we constantly been improving this whole season you know because guys are guys are always trying to be better better today than they were yesterday and that's that's a mentality that's it's something that you really want in a team of course 
I know there's still uh, about 10 days to go before the regular season ends, and obviously the ultimate goal is to, to win the Stanley Cup, which is uh, a fun, fun time of year. It's my one of my favorite postseasons in all of professional sports, and I know you guys are excited for it as well, provided that you can continue on this uh, trajectory and clinch that playoff spot. But with with what you, how with how this season has gone, with all the ebbs and flows that can come in an 82 regular game sample size, how do you kind of manage that with a team that's got as many young parts as you guys do? Yeah, uh, no, I mean it's definitely a challenge, but I think that's something that we've learned a lot about during the whole season. Obviously, we started started okay, had a horrible road trip when we lost a lot of the games in a row and then we turned it around and won a bunch of games in a row. And it was, it was like you said, very much the definition of a, of a team, but uh, some, some growing pains, you know, but once, once we started to realize what kind of team we were, what kind of, of uh, yeah, what kind of game we had to play with this, this team, um, things started to change for us. And, and obviously since, since the all-star break, we, we all know that the record we've had and, and the way we've been playing. And uh, I think that's something that comes with, with learning and obviously with, with more experience as, as we go during the season. Phil Forsberg here with us on 104.5 The Zone talking about the Preds after a big win against the St. Louis Blues last night. Uh, Mr. Forsberg, permission to ask you a question, please. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, 30 seconds in, you guys opened the scoring last night. Uh, did you have your hand raised? I didn't see your hand raised. With Roman. Uh, Andrew Burnett, I'm curious, what is Bruno like as a pregame type of coach with his pregame speech, and what did he say to you guys yesterday to have you get off to the start that you did? Uh, no, I think he's he's passionate for sure. He's uh, I feel like he's, he's keeping it somewhat under control, though. Like, there's been times, obviously, throughout the season when he's needed to raise his voice in an unfriendly way, but <laughs> thankfully not not too, not too many times. But like I said, I think his, his composure is, is definitely one of his strengths as a coach. doesn't matter if we're playing phenomenal or horrible like he keeps it keeps it pretty pretty real like it's never as good as you think and it's never as bad as you think either and I think he's got a really good grasp of that but I think yeah but the, the game yesterday we all knew what kind of game it was going to be with with everything on the line and I think he did a really good job just kind of amping us up but also keeping us under control and and like I said that first goal was obviously quite the start how how easy is it to kind of identify I mean I, I know you've had a, a variety of different coaches throughout the course of your career but like you guys have to be able to tell when that stuff's artificial. And and I understand as a coach, you may want to try and get your team up occasionally, but like those kind of hype speeches, I'm always curious how they actually work with professional athletes. Yeah, no, like you said, sometimes you, you're you not going to be at the top of your excitement every single game for 82 games. Obviously there's going to be days where, where some guys are on, some guys are a little bit off. And I think that's the challenge of a coach is trying to drag everybody into the fight. And instead of having – a B game, you can get them to play a C or a, a B game, you know, like I said, every A plus is not going to be the case every single time. But I think that's been something that Bruno's done a really good job, but also the leadership group and our team. I think that's at the end of the day, the coaches are, are really good at what they do and preparing and, and details and everything. But the fire has got to come from inside the team too. You know, like you need the leadership, you need everybody to kind of drag each other uh, with, with them. Like I said, if I'm not having a, a great game, I need my teammates to pick me up and, and get me going. And I think that's something that we've been, doing really well as a late also all right it's uh now we have people following the proper protocol yes you with the giant head with your hand raised in the back of the class uh, yes mr forsberg tying your career high with your 43rd goal yesterday also the single season franchise record and now with a couple of weeks to set a new career high and officially make a new franchise record do you feel this is the best you have played as a national predators forward yeah yep Consistently, I do think so. I think, like I said, there's been times when I've been red hot for certain months and stuff like that throughout my career here. But I do think that, that the way that I've been able to play consistently throughout the season is, is probably the best that I've felt. And obviously a lot of credit to, to Nyquist and O'Reilly. The way we've been playing together, the chemistry the three of us have is something that makes it really easy to play every night. I mean, you know exactly where those guys are going to be and what they're going to do in pretty much every situation on the ice. And that's something that, that is... I mean, if you can get to that level, the success is going to come, whether whether it's it's right away or after time. Uh, for us, it was, it was obviously a little bit of both. I mean, we clicked right away, and it's been carrying on throughout the season. And so I give those guys a lot of time of credit, not just for the way we the way we play together, but also for the way they play. I think I've learned a ton this year just playing with those two guys and kind of broadening my 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 hockey knowledge and my hockey, like just 
try to be more of a, a 200 foot player. And I think those guys are perfect examples of that. And uh, yeah, I've been, I've been fortunate to play with those guys all season for sure. Uh, I know you guys have had some incredible atmospheres across the course of your career here, Phil, but like Bridgestone arena, the vibe in there lately, it's, it's, it's starting to remind some of us of 2017. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but like the vibes have been absolutely electric every time we've been to a game this year. Yeah, we've been, uh, We've been building some some good uh, good some good mojo in there for sure, and the fans have responded well to it. And obviously, having the four one comeback against Vegas, and then the one nothing win against Detroit, being back to back games, really were two yeah incredibly exciting games, obviously. And uh, yeah, the fans the fans love it. We love it. It's uh, it, it's a really cool cool partnership that we definitely want to keep keep going as long as we can with the fans for sure. Uh, they're on the road tomorrow against the Islanders. It's a 6.30 puck drop. Uh, Phil Forsberg of the National Predators here with us on 104.5 The Zone. Uh, Mr. Forsberg, Michael McCarron <laughs> nominated for the Bill Masterson Memorial Trophy. Uh, I'm just curious your perspective on what it's been like to watch him. For those who don't know, it's the trophy awarded to an NHL player who best exemplifies qualities of perseverance, sportsmanship, and and dedication to hockey. What's it been like for you watching Michael McCarron kind of grow back within this team and the way that he's helped you guys on the ice and personally as well? It's been remarkable. Nothing but remarkable. I just, obviously, we uh, he, he took a massive step last year by just basically taking care of himself, you know, kind of entering the program, taking yeah, getting the help that he needed, and you see the result you saw in day one in training camp. It's it's almost like he he was I wouldn't say a different person. He's always been a phenomenal teammate and a great guy to have around the room. But you could just see the yeah, you could just see it right away. He was there, he was ready to work, he was ready to take that next step in, in life and in, in his career and he's been great for us. Not just he's always gonna be the guy that, that blocks a shot, the the yeah, the fights when he has to, like all those things that, that takes the real toughness, but just the way he's elevated his puck play, his offensive game. I think that was his twelfth goal yesterday too and Massive goals for us too, and uh, I think, yeah, he's he's been one of our most improved players for sure, if not the one most improved. And it's been you see that fourth line, what what has happened to our team since they've really started taking off. We get that that fourth line with that depth. I mean, every every line we have on our team can hurt the other team. Doesn't matter who who they're out against. And and yeah, Mac has been been leading that fourth line to to greatness. I mean, he's been he's been awesome for us. All right, is it Mac or is it Big Sexy? I mean, I I, uh, I thought we were keeping it somewhat uh, PG thirteen on the oh, radio, but God, it's no, big, Phil. Big, big sexy for sure. PG thirteen is sexy. <laughs> I can't say that on FM radio, Phil. What do you What do you think PG thirteen is? Yeah, you you know me. We're in the South, man. You never know. So. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Uh, Phil, I, we really appreciate the time. Congratulations on all the success. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we're looking forward to seeing what you guys do against the Islanders tomorrow. Sounds great. Thanks for having me, guys. That's Phil Forsberg. Uh, very kind to put up with our nonsense. I'm sorry. Did you say you had one more in my ear? I did. I wanted to ask him about the uh, Premier League Fan Fest coming to Nashville this Saturday because a bunch of former Premier League players, Daniel Sturridge, who played for Liverpool, who I know Forsberg is a fan of, Jack Collison, Matt Jarvis, who were West Ham players, were like hanging out with the players before the game and taking pictures and stuff like that. So uh, I'm sure that was a cool moment for Phil, especially getting to meet Sturridge, who used to score g- goals for his favorite club. Well, Other than Nashville, see, of course. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that he plays along with that bit every time. <laughs> uh, this fan fest thing, you will have some level of involvement. Yes, do you want to tell people what you're doing? I'm helping out West Ham United. They are holding a Q and A with former West Ham midfielder Matt Jarvis at uh, Hard Rock on Lower Broadway. So just am seeing it, answering questions from fans. There will be a video played from. West Ham manager David Moyes, so looking forward to being involved. And then I'll head to Geodis Park in the afternoon for a match against Philadelphia. G. Sully uh, in the FNM Bank chat on YouTube accuses me of looking like I was trying to care about your soccer question for Philip Forsberg. <laughs> Did you also get that vibe from me as I stared at you? Yeah, but I don't care about what you care about. <laughs> I care about what Philip Forsberg cares about, and I know he cares about Liverpool and Nashville Soccer Club. I know. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five is the number. It was. Uh, it's. It's just fun to watch him and Yossi. And I know they've. They've got all kinds of different players that have really stepped up throughout the course of the last two months that they've been on this heater and to get back right against a conference opponent 
last night critical. They could catch Winnipeg uh, with this. With uh, Their last regular season game is April the 15th, I believe. I, I saw, um, oh, I'm blanking on who sent that in earlier to the chat. Uh, Jeremy Gover, Jeremy K. Gover. The Preds are six points back from Winnipeg. Both have six games left, so Nashville can catch Winnipeg in the Central Division. Based on what their schedules look like, it seems favorable uh, for Nashville, given that Winnipeg will have to play three different playoff teams, including Nashville, uh, excuse me, four different playoff teams, including Nashville down that stretch. The pendulum swings the Preds are experiencing right now from the 18-game point streak to three straight regulation losses to getting back on track last night, but back on track also on the power play. It wasn't just that the power play let them down against Boston on Tuesday. They were 0 for their last nine Mm. on the power play. Last night, 2 for 3. They're 5 for 6 on the penalty kill. So back and forth we've gone here. It's setting up for a fun postseason. I legitimately hated that we didn't have postseason hockey last year. And I'm excited to see what they're able to do, how much noise they're able to make. We'll see what uh, what the bracket for the Stanley Cup looks like here in just a couple of weeks, less than a couple of weeks. As a matter of fact, and we can hope that they're still playing in June. I, um, how do we feel? What What's the vibe around Nashville SC right now? Because I know you've been talking a lot of soccer. And I'm kind of unclear on where where their season is heading. I know it's very, very early on. But the amount of players that they're missing right now, I'm not really sure what to make of their team. Yeah, it's Make tough. me smarter about the soccer sure. team. Sure. No, defensively, Walker Zimmerman, Shaq Moore, Lucas McNaughton finally uh, could get a chance to play on Saturday after missing a few games. And then elsewhere on the roster, there's been injuries. Hani Mukhtar, Sam Surge have experienced injuries early on in the season. I mean, it's been tough. They, it's kind of whenever they've gotten one key figure back, another's dropped off. They haven't played a single game this year where your three designated players, Mukhtar, Surge, and Zimmerman, are on the field together. Hasn't happened once this season. So they're, they've been battling through that, but uh, but they needed a bounce-back performance last Saturday, which is what they got against Columbus. They just didn't get the result. So now it's about turning these draws into wins, turning one point into three points, and they get a chance to do that at home tomorrow against what's been one of the most consistent teams in MLS over the last five years in Philadelphia Union. So that's the challenge right now is overcoming key absences, especially in the back with Walker Zimmerman and Shaq Moore, and doing that in a way that allows you to make these leads into wins. Because last year, when Nashville would score two goals in a game, they were guaranteed a win. They were 13-0-0. They did not lose. They did not draw when scoring two or more goals in a league game. Well, and that's been their identity Absolutely. to be able to play that level of defense and keep them in that in those kind of games when they can get those leads. Absolutely. So it's about getting back to that because they've had two league games where they've scored two goals, but they've ended in two-to-two two draws. And, and I think they will get out of that, especially when they get those reinforcements back from injury. But Sam Surge is playing well. Honey Mukhtar got off the mark for his first league goal last Saturday. So we'll see if now they come kind of in a flurry. And they're getting goal contributions kind of scattered around the roster, which is a very positive sign. So it uh, will be a great crowd, as always. A beautiful night at Geodis Park on Saturday. And a good team coming to town in Philadelphia. It's supposed to be the nicest day of the weekend, looks like. Enough of this cold weather nonsense. Um... We have an SEC stat of the day next. I'm unclear on what your SEC stat of the day is going to involve, given that there's only one SEC team still playing college basketball, still playing men's college basketball this weekend. What is the SEC stat of the day? Uh, It will be regarding Alabama, the only men's college basketball team left in the SEC. South Carolina, obviously alive and undefeated on the women's side of the bracket. I hate that Indiana almost had them at the end. They did. Tennessee. Indiana and Tennessee have been the two teams that have most given South Carolina a run this season in their crazy dominant stretch they've had under Don Staley. And uh, both of us came up short. But we'll talk Bama hoops next. Okay.
Okay, so you're feeling the album now. You were concerned when the initial uh, Cowboy Carter started to... Uh, stuff started to come out with Texas Hold'em and 16 Carriages that they were going to be overplayed. I was. I was concerned with Texas Hold'em because you're seeing it on TikToks and on Instagram Reels and it's all over the place. It's only a matter of time. And I was very afraid that come six months from now, I'm going to be like over that song. But I finally got a chance to listen to Cowboy Carter. The whole thing. From start to finish. And it is amazing. I've listened to it start to finish. Turn this up a little bit. Like three or four times. This bodyguard, bodyguard, right? Yeah. Yeah. And was, what she does with Jolene and Dolly's little cameo on the album. And the song with Miley. So good. Oh, but it's not a country album. It's it's a Beyonce album, right? Can we can we agree upon that? Not not even for the people who are like, Beyonce can't make country albums, blah, 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 blah. Oakley's. <laughs> But, but like, it's not, it sounds like there could have been a country album in there. Maybe they started out making a country album and then it just turned into a Beyonce album, which is fine. I'm good with it. I don't care. If Florida Georgia Line can make country music, then why the hell can't Beyonce? Uh, but all of it is phenomenal. So good. It's so long, though. Like, that's, that's something that, I, that's why I feel like it turned into something else from what they started out making. Either way. Uh, SEC stat of the day, please. So, wait. I don't have the music. What do you mean you don't have the music? I mean, I forgot to pull it up. This is your segment. That's what happened. Pull up the music. That's what happened. What if Landon is listening to the show? He waits every week for Friday at 1045 for that, Lucas's. That, that is the only reason I am SEC efforting it right stat now. stat of the day. This is your moment. You're we right. block out I, airtime specifically for you, and you don't have your music? Normally, I would just plow right through and do it anyway, but because of even the, just even the possibility of Landon listening, I don't want to let Landon down. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about the SEC. Let's talk about Nick Saban and Josh Heupel in the SEC. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about the SEC. Let's talk about Brian Kelly and Greg Sankey in the SEC. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about Alabama, who is in the Final Four. It pains me to say it, but the first ever Final Four in program history. What Nate Oates has done with that program has to be commended. They knock off one seed, do or excuse me, UNC on the way to it. They get a Clemson draw in the Elite Eight, take care of business, 89-82, and now they have to face the juggernaut that is UConn. The stat of the day, first of all, is the thing that I think could let Alabama down in this game, and it's not just their defense, because they've actually defended well at times in this tournament. Uh, it is turning the ball over. Alabama, throughout the course of the regular season, was bottom four in the SEC. They averaged 11.9 turnovers per game. It's not very good. In the tournament, they're right around there. They've averaged 11.5 turnovers per game. They turned it over 10 times against Charleston, 13 times against Grand Canyon, 10 times against UNC, 13 times against Clemson. If there is a team that makes you pay for turning the ball over and turns defense into offense, it is UConn better than almost anybody in the country. So Alabama is going to have to stay hot from the outside, but that's just a perpetual fact with this team. If the threes are not falling, Alabama is probably going to struggle to outscore you. The problem is the threes are typically falling for Alabama because they take so damn many. How many three-pointers do you think they took against Clemson, Buck? And it was actually, I mean, they, they've taken more threes than they did against Clemson. I'll say 30. 36. Oh. And they hit 16 <laughs> of them. <laughs> to shoot 36 threes and shoot a 44.4% rate from three. You'll take it. You're probably going to win. And it's role players coming off and doing that. We know how good Sears is, right? He's 7 of 14 from three in that game against Clemson. He was hot. He was good. But it's the way that Nate Oates encourages guys to shoot, regardless of what they've done to that point in the season, of what their role is on the team. Jaron Stevenson is the perfect perfect example. The Alabama forward, who was sub-30%, pretty much all season from three, comes off the bench and just lets them fly. He goes five of eight from three against Clemson. He's a huge factor off the bench with 19 points. He's their second lead scorer, and Alabama wins that game by seven. Like, 
Alabama can get good looks from three, and a guy could air ball four in a row, and Nate Oates will tell him, keep shooting. He's very analytical, and they're going to continue to play that way against UConn. This has potential to be a really fun game. Like, this has, I think this will be the more entertaining game. Oh, for sure. Of the Final Four. I think Purdue could run away from NC State. But I also think that NC State, like, Purdue... Purdue losing to a double-digit seed, maybe it's just a narrative at this point, and NC State is obviously the only double-digit seed left in the Final Four. Um, I might be inclined to bet NC State plus the nine. Plus the nine, I think you can get them nine, nine and a half some places. Alabama is obviously the biggest underdog at 11 and a half, um, and they've lost 11 different games this year. UConn has only lost three, and they're true road games that UConn has lost, and it hasn't really felt like road environments for them at all during the tournament. I'm sure Phoenix will be no different. This this matchup, though, is fascinating because it's not just it's not just the idea of, of playing the percentages, Lucas, although there is that component to it. Nate Oates encouraging guys who may not be the best or most consistent shooters on their team to take the open looks anyway. It's kind of like Dawn Staley against Tennessee, where who's who's the six foot seven girl that that had Cardoso. the the opportunity yeah. to tie the game with a two, actually step back, hit a three, the first three of her career, if I'm not mistaken, That's correct, hit a three to beat Tennessee, and yes, understandably, Tennessee left her completely unguarded. Why the hell would she pull up from range? But it's still the idea that Dawn, there's zeros on the clock and they're losing well, and they, they need it. Dawn Staley coaching her up the entire time because you can see yeah. her on the sideline saying, shoot it, shoot it. Uh, that you don't you don't want a coach in the tournament, especially that's going to discourage anybody from taking open looks just because they may not be the most efficient players. You've seen this issue with UConn's team playing? Yeah, I I heard uh what I happened heard, here? Uh, Hurley is is hot. About it, I think he uh, he had given out a couple of statements to various college basketball writers. So apparently, there was some mechanical issues with yeah. UConn's plane to get to Phoenix. Um, I saw the Matt Norlander tweet yesterday. Uh, do you have the article in front of you? I don't. Well, I can I can pull up Norlander's well, tweet well, just to get the well, specifics. That, but I saw that there was mechanical issues with the plane. They've been having a variety of different uh, travel difficulties to try and get to the Final Four. Apparently, the thing is rigged uh, against yes. UConn. <laughs> Let's hear from Nate Oates on this. Not quite sure what happened with the plane. I um, it wasn't me. I didn't send anybody over there to uh, to mess with the uh, mechanics. I'm sure he's uh, conjured that up in his head already. But. Uh, yeah, I did get a good night's sleep last night, so it's nice. Uh, but um, I'm sure he'll be fired up and ready to go Saturday. It'll it'll be uh, fun, and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll touch base after the game. Okay, so I I love him. I love Nate Oates just referring to Dan Hurley as him. I'm sure he'll he'll have conjured this up in his head by the time we get to get to the game. So here's the tweet from Matt Norlander. UConn does not have a plane to fly to Arizona at the moment. Dan Hurley tells CBS Sports was supposed to take off at 6 Eastern. Logistical slash mechanical issues. So basically all of the issues, both logistical and mechanical. Plane isn't operable. With the plane coming in from Kansas City for significant delays, the NCAA handles all travel for NCAA teams. The issue for UConn is the crew flying the plane from Kansas City would be over their FAA hours Mm. and can't fly UConn immediately to Arizona. UConn's earliest option to get a smaller plane via Cincinnati that won't take off until 1245 a.m. Eastern and not land until nearly 5 a.m. Pacific time. The plane from Cincinnati would require a fuel stop because it's smaller. The Huskies are going to get to Arizona with hours to spare before Thursday media availability. They have tried for an hour working every charter possible, but nothing is available for the next five hours. There, this is a this is a uh, twelve tweet thread. It goes on at some length. Uh, UConn apparently landed at six twelve Eastern time this morning. Was it six twelve? Yes. This morning? I no, thought I'm sorry. Yesterday, yesterday morning. morning. Yesterday right. morning. Okay. I thought they landed earlier than that. I thought it was like three or four a.m. I love Nate. Uh, 312 Pacific. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. In Phoenix. Got it. Uh, I love Nate Oates saying, I got a good night's sleep last <laughs> night while UConn is trying to. Yeah, the FAA hours, that's a factor. Do you remember the infamous poop plane? 
Well, yeah, we did a whole, famously, we yes. did an interview about the poop plane. My friend Chloe was on the poop plane Ugh. with her husband, Bruce. I hate that word. The reason that they could not just stop in D.C. because they were almost, like, they were over D.C. when they had to turn around. It was going to Barcelona. They had to turn around and come back to Atlanta. And passengers, Chloe told me, were asking, why don't we just land in D.C.? And then they clean the plane and we get, it's like, because these flight attendants have to get back home. It would violate their FAA hour, so they had to go all the way back to Atlanta. So uh, no poop plane for UConn, but still, that is a nightmare. And Dan Hurley surely is going to use that to his advantage. Is there any kind of tra- difficulty that's worse and can be more complex than travel difficulties? Like flying right now, and I, I do a fair amount of flying during a portion of my working uh, working calendar it terrifies me to have anything go wrong with a plane ride just because it's a disaster to try and get it cleaned up afterwards. I know so many people can relate with this, especially probably coming off of spring break and stuff like that. Nightmare at the airport. Uh, we have Coach Matt coming up in the final, or rather not the final hour, the second hour. We have a final four preview for both the men's and the women's is what I mean to say. Some more college hoops and Coach Mac next.
It is 11.02. Good morning. I'm Lucas Panzica from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. The Nashville Predators snapped a three-game losing skid last night. 6-3 to three was the final over the St. Louis Blues. Philip Forsberg with two goals and an assist. And for Forsberg, that is his 42nd and 43rd goal of the season. It ties a career high as well as a single-season franchise record. The Preds head northeast. They visit the Islanders on Saturday at 6.30 and the Devils on Sunday at 6 before they return home. In NFL news, the Eagles have agreed to terms with left tackle Jordan Mailata on a three-year, $66 million extension that includes $48 million in guaranteed money. In free agency, veteran outside linebacker Kyle Van Noy returns to the Ravens on a two-year deal after producing a career-high nine sacks last season with the Ravens. We have number changes with the Tennessee Titans, including free agents Tony Pollard, Legereus Sneed, among players that will keep their numbers. Pollard 20, Sneed 38. Kenneth Murray Jr. goes from nine with the Chargers to 56 with the Titans. Calvin Ridley will continue to wear zero. Tajay Spears changes to number two, and offensive lineman Jalen Duncan is moving to number 71. For all your front, for all your foundation repair and waterproofing ah. needs, you guys hear something? Visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. We got a final four to talk about in both the men's and women's side of college basketball. It's a shame that one of the best postseasons in sports is getting ready to wrap up, but we still have a couple of games to go. I do want to say, though, that there is nothing. I don't think there's anything on the radio show that delights me more than when you screw up your breaking sports news update and I can just laugh at you before you before you dive across your console back there to try and turn my microphone off. So the audience can't hear me laugh. Well, the joke's on you because it doesn't affect me at all. I don't think so. I don't think that's true. I think you're going to be shook for it the rest of the day. I'm not upset about it. <laughs> Look at him off my Quit pouting. It up. I'm not mad. <laughs> Just pouty. And so what, what can you do? He's he's already mailing it, and it's a Friday. What can you do? He's he, Him and Bert probably have some grand plans this weekend, they're probably going man-teaking, and he just can't <laughs> wait to get out of here. No, no, I'm too busy this weekend. I'd love soccer. to go man-teaking. Yes, I do. Soccer, a soccer Saturday for me. I am excited about that. Indeed. Uh, I'm excited for some college basketball. We'll preview both of the Final Fours here. Coach Mack will join us in about 20 minutes. 615-737-1045 is the number. If you want to jump in, you can interact on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch as well. So... Uh, would you describe this as one of the more unlikely four pairings of four teams that we could have projected when we got the initial bracket? UConn, Alabama, NC State, and Purdue. Maybe you had Purdue. Maybe you had, I mean, I'm sure many of you obviously had UConn, and probably the only thing that your bracket is clinging to is UConn winning the national title and continuing their uh, route of dominance so far this tournament, though this game against Alabama will be the most interesting. I just, I certainly would not have had Alabama being the only team left out of the SEC. And NC State, we talked about this a couple of different times. Their coach was going to get fired at the end of their regular season. I don't think anybody in the country, even like, I, I listen to Gary Parish and Matt Norlander. They do a great podcast, a college basketball podcast for CBS Sports. And I think I went the entire season listening to them to talk, talk about ACC hoops without hearing about DJ Burns once. And all of a sudden, he's the darling of March Madness. I'm not going to lie to you. I thought he was out of college basketball. Like, I remember DJ Burns transferring from Tennessee to Winthrop and leading Winthrop to the tournament and dominating with Winthrop and just thinking, oh, okay, he's probably done. And then hearing the name DJ Burns with NC State, I thought, no, that can't be. Oh, that's the same guy. So UConn is the most expected quantity out of any of these four. Purdue, 
has some doubters to disprove. That's the first time we've heard Zach Eady get chesty at the podium after beating Tennessee. He brought up the idea that Rick Barnes was somebody who didn't recruit him. And, you know, I'm sure Tennessee fans have been in his mentions if he's on social media the same way that Vols fans have been in Dennis Kelly's mentions, apparently. And as you say that, Zach Eady is officially named the AP Player of the Year. Oh, is that officially official? For the second consecutive year, he is the first back-to-back winner since Ralph Sampson at Virginia in the 80s. And that is very, very good company to be in. Deserved. Zach Eady is the most unstoppable thing in college basketball. And we played for you the Matt Painter audio about if you think that it's just the fact that he's 7'4 that makes him good at basketball, Matt Painter thinks that you deserve to be suspended from talking about, tweeting about, covering, or otherwise college basketball. But it undoubtedly, his size is an asset, and he understands how to use it really, really well. So it's, I mean, he is immediately, and it, you know, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth to talk about Purdue in any kind of glowing terms, but he's arguably the best player in the history of Purdue basketball, Zach Eady. He received 57 of 62 votes to win the AP Player of the Year award. Dalton Connect received three, and Houston's Jamal Shedd received two. I'm surprised Connect got as many as three. So, Edie and UConn, like, if you if we came in here on Monday and NC State is in the final after upsetting Purdue, it would not surprise me. I think that UConn, or excuse me, I think that NC State is the underdog that I would be most comfortable betting on. And for no other reason besides I think that that could be the weirder result. I think UConn, UConn and Alabama should be a closer game. UConn has not allowed a team to score more than 60 points in the tournament. They have absolutely kept their foot on people's necks. And the the competition has been inferior because they are the most dominant thing in college basketball. Feels like last year we kind of talked about there not being one clearly and obviously better team in the men's side of things. UConn has, has established themselves as that throughout the course of this tournament and throughout the course of their regular season. It's crazy that all the teams that we looked at as, man, what a gauntlet on UConn's side of the bracket They didn't have to face Auburn, who choked against Yale in the first round. They didn't have to face Iowa State, who lost to Illinois. Illinois is a good basketball team. And UConn promptly went on a 30-0 run. Rocked. But honestly, it doesn't matter. Like, we could sit here and say they got fortunate with the way it shook out. They probably would have ran Auburn. They probably would have ran Iowa State. We, We don't know. But the way that they're playing, they're pretty unstoppable right now. Alabama could threaten them. We talked about their ability to make it close at any given point. No matter how many they trail by, they can get themselves back into the game very, very easily with how willing they are to pull up from three and how many of the threes they've been hitting in tournament play. The defense has continued to be optional. Nate Oates has not been shy about that, but they make up for it. So you think NC State is more likely to upset Purdue than Alabama is to UConn? Yes, I do. I'm fascinated at how NC State plays Purdue. Because Tennessee just did the take away everything else and ISO defending on Zach Eady. Make Zach Eady beat us, and he did. He goes for 40. Purdue hit three three three-pointers in that game. Like, that's not their game. Purdue has good outside shooters. They can get into good spots when Eady is doubled, tripled in the post. Tennessee didn't do that. Eady made them pay. How does NC State approach that? And if they go about it in a similar way, we're about to see DJ Burns and Zach Eady battling battling for 40 minutes and i will sign up for that he's six seven though next to ed seven four i don't know what that looks like i don't either <laughs> i mean i know what it looks I like i don't know what you do <laughs> i mean do you go low do you do you go the tobey walker route and, and just and, and just try and put your 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 elbows into his sternum he was basically in a three-point stance the whole time <laughs> yeah uh and a walk is six eight so Burns is is definitely wider, but definitely has a little slightly more smaller width to him, much more width. But I don't know. I don't know what you do. Um. Then there's the women's side of things, and if we're talking about UConn on the men's side of things, South Car- South Carolina is that for the women's Final Four. You get the uh, you get a fun Final Four game between Paige Beckers at UConn and Iowa and Caitlin Clark on the one side of the bracket. 
and then trying to see how, uh, if at all possible, South Carolina can be undone in the middle of all this remains to be seen. The, the, the fact that NC State is in both of these Final Fours is hugely impressive. South Carolina feels like they've got the more obvious path to or the easier path to the national championship than UConn does through Alabama because I think that Alabama can threaten UConn in ways that NC State based on what South Carolina has done it's it, it's a one game sample size anything can happen that's what makes the tournament fun and as we've talked about Tennessee had a shot at South Carolina in the regular season Indiana had a shot at them in the Elite Eight both were they just didn't make enough plays at the end of the game. I hate to be cliche about it, but South Carolina just outlasted them as far as playmaking went. And so I think that it's going to be easier for South Carolina to advance to the national championship than it will be for UConn, but I'd expect both of them to be there in the respective respective sports. First time ever that one school makes both the men's and women's Final Four in the same year, and that's NC State. I agree with you, though. UConn, Iowa has potential to be a classic like to one up Iowa LSU because Iowa kind of pulled away. I know it was the most watched women's basketball game in college history, and it was a really good game for about three quarters. But Iowa was the better. Well, Caitlin Clark was the best player on the floor. That in turn made Iowa the best, the better team, and they pulled away. But UConn Iowa could have potential to be just an all time game in the history of college basketball. G Soley on the F and M Bank chat says. I think Burns is the has the build that could take Edie. And Jim is interested to see if the refs call the game like they did against Tennessee. Yeah, because it's a matter of strength. Like, Zach Edie is not, all, not only just from a height standpoint, physically overwhelming. He's, he's a, a mule out there. He's Frankenstein's monster, okay? This dude is ungodly strong on top of being ungodly tall. And it's just a matter of, can Burns hang in the post with him without fouling gratuitously? Because we know that Edie's style of play lends itself to drawing those fouls, which is exactly what was a part of the undoing for Tennessee. I misread the stat. It's the first time that two programs have men's and women's teams in the Final Four in the same year with NC State and UConn. Ja L says, NC State... Plus, UConn men's and women's are both in the Final Four. Stop with the SEC is the best. Well, I, is the SEC claiming to be the best in college basketball? I think at various points throughout the season, yeah. The SEC was saying, look at us. Like, They're one of the deeper yeah. conferences I for think sure. it was. It was SEC and Big 12 if for anything, the majority of the season. If anything, I would hold that up for Alabama and South Carolina and be like, no, we survived an SEC schedule where the teams cannibalize each other regularly. This prepares you for this kind of tournament play where every game, and I know that there are conferences where the basketball is also as competitive. The Big Ten had a down year. The ACC didn't have its best year, and certainly NC State is taking advantage of a down ACC year. But I think, I mean, I think there's plenty of evidence to say that the SEC is one of the best conferences in men's and women's college basketball, if not the best. I think the best varies from year to year. Coming up next, Coach Dave McGinnis will talk about the Titans getting a head start on their offseason. April the 8th is their first day to report. Real quick, interesting SEC basketball potential news before you go to Coach Mack. Ole Miss head coach Chris Beard has emerged reportedly as one of the leading candidates for the Arkansas job. While we're talking about SEC basketball, that would be a massive in-conference move as Eric Musselman is now the head coach at USC. He's like, uh, did you watch Game of Thrones? Oh, yeah. Chaos is a ladder. <laughs> that's, that's Chris Beard's approach to uh, continuing to be uh, relevant in college basketball after that unflattering situation at Texas. Anyway, Coach Mack coming up next. We'll talk some draft. We'll talk some offseason. I'm Buck Rising. It's 1045 The Zone.
Vibes are high on a Friday, especially when Coach Max Music is playing. His visits, as always, presented by Two Rivers Ford, the South's most trusted Ford dealership. Two Rivers Ford, just seven miles east of BNA in Mount Julia. Check them out online at tworiversford.com. Happy Friday, Mac. Yeah, Buck, you guys are taking all the shows out to Two Rivers next week, huh? That's a great deal. We sure are. We're gonna be uh, we're gonna be there uh, for the eclipse. Apparently, our friend Tammy Jacobs has gotten us all uh, eclipse glasses. We're trying to decide whether I should, for uh, for LLS fundraising purposes, see how much money somebody will pay me to look directly at it without the glasses on. But but first of all. Uh, the LLS campaign is a very admirable thing that you're doing. Second of all, don't do that. <laughs> Coach, it's don't for cancer that. research. One thousand, a one one thousand dollar donation, and he, and he will do it. <laughs> First of all, Buck, don't do that. You can raise money other ways, uh, so don't do that. Second of all, Tammy will have everything set up for you, so just follow protocols and don't go off the reservation looking at it. Naked eye. Uh, that's uh, we, the last time there was one of these. I was actually at a Titans practice, and Dick LeBeau was like threatening all of us if we uh, if we took our sunglasses off that he would get into us. And even at an advanced age, I'm scared of that man. What's the worst that could yeah. happen? Well, they sta- you you go blind. That's the whole thing. That's why they have the glasses, dummy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but do not a thousand dollars. I'll pay you a thousand dollars not to do it. <laughs> this is why, right? This is why we love Coach Mac because he's the only one uh, around here willing to protect me from myself. Uh, we go. are going to have a. This is this is going. This is setting up to be a really really fun year in the AFC South, Mac. I know that. You know, seeing the Texan sign Stephon Diggs is probably not Titans fans' favorites. And, you know, Calvin Ridley going from the Jags to uh, Tennessee is probably going to rankle a couple of Jags fans. But this sets up to be one of the more competitive years, top to bottom, that we've had, especially when Trevor Lawrence is the old man at this point with so many young quarterbacks. Well, it just shows you how fast things can change in the National Football League. And, of course, it's it's cyclical, as we all know. I mean, it really is. And it, it just depends on... Uh, that's why you have to strike, you know, when the iron's hot, you know, for your team. And a lot of it comes with having a, you know, a, a, either a, a really established quarterback that you can pay a lot of money to, but then piecemeal around and he can lift you above uh, the others, you know, like what Kansas City is doing. Or, you know, you get a, you get a, a, a very functional quarterback on a rookie contract and then try to try to build around him. So it's pretty interesting to see, you know, what's going on. Houston Again, you know, had three years where they were just, I mean, what they won 11, you know, they won 11 games in three years. I mean, so they had a chance to accumulate some real draft capital. They got very fortunate, you know, in a, in a huge trade when they traded away, you know, a quarterback that Cleveland was really willing to take off their hands for money and also for a, for a lot of picks. And so all of a sudden now you see the culmination of drafting in the top five in a lot of rounds. And they're starting to, you know, to add some more pieces. Uh, They won the division last year with a rookie quarterback that had a really, really good year. But they've got a good football team because they've been able to build up that draft capital that they accumulated when they, you know, had earned one of the top five picks for three years in a row. So, and and, and Diggs, I think, is, I mean, it's clearly, regardless of what uh, the circumstances were at Buffalo, I mean, you know, it, it, it was a separation, obviously, that both parties wanted because the Buffalo is willing to eat a lot of money, and then you know he's willing to come in, and you know they they the, the Houston got him, you know, basically on a one year deal. Yeah. So, you know, they're going for it. That's what they're doing right now, and then you know they 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 figure they they hit a pretty good mark uh, last last year, and they're trying to they're trying to build on it. So. It's going to be very, very interesting, uh, you know, with with this division because, as you well know, all of your listeners know too, it can flip. It can flip really quick, and so that's what makes the National Football League, you know, the monster that it is. Is that everybody, at, because of the way the salary cap works and because of the way the draft works, you've got a chance to to rebuild. Uh, just depending on where, if you're if you're not starting from ground zero, you've got a chance to rebuild pretty quickly. Coach Dave McGinnis here with us on 104.5 The Zone, talking some ball with Coach Mack, presented by Two Rivers Ford. How important is it as a a coach? Because obviously you deal with all manner of dudes, all kinds of different personalities, all different stages at their career, where they're coming in as, you know, just basically college kids to people in their 30s who have three children at home and have a whole different kind of lifestyle. 
than the rest of your roster might. How important is it as a coach to be straight up with somebody like Stephon Diggs to manage expectations and, and kind of manage his personality right out of the gate? Well, you've got it. I mean, that, that's the, the main thing. Regardless of the personality of the guys that you're bringing in, uh, I learned this early on, you know, in, in my in my coaching career, and, and it, it stood me pretty well for over three decades of coaching this league. You got to be honest. You got to be honest with these guys because regardless regardless of what age they are, Buck, they're still full grown men, and and you know, and, and they're playing they're playing uh, the game for their career. You know, it's their career now. And, of course, you know, people are at different stages in their career. But still, I mean, it goes back to the to the adage that Mike Dicka told me when he hired me. Every day is an interview in this league for everybody that's involved in it. And so if you approach it like that and you also approach it like that with, with each individual player, you've got to hand, you've got to be you've got to be fair to everybody. But you've got to, you know, everybody you've got to approach sometimes in a little bit of a different manner. That's the key to trying to build a team is get different personalities and people that, you know, you may have to approach a little differently, you know, buying into a common goal, you know, for whatever reason they have for wanting to buy in, you've got to get everybody to buy in, but you've got to be honest. I mean, you've got to be honest straight up with them, Buck, because that, again, my first uh, foray into this league, you know, when I sat down to dinner before I ever hit a practice field with Mike Singletary and asked him what I needed to do, as really a young coach that had no NFL experience to earn the respect of guys that, you know, had already, you know, uh, were, were pro bowl players, how to get the respect. He said, one of the main keys he said is be honest with us. And so that's something that you have to do with everybody in this league, because everybody, uh, these guys are, these guys, regardless of, of where they are in, in their, in their careers, they, um, they know when you're telling them the truth and they know when you're trying to be yes. Coach, with the first day of the offseason program starting on Monday, what is the goal? What are the Titans looking to accomplish just on day one of the offseason program with a lot of new faces and a new staff? Well, that's what that's what it is, Lucas. It's it's new faces. Everything everything is going to be new, you know. You know, for everybody, it's a new group. Uh, You guys have been to enough practices with enough different coaching staffs to know everybody runs their practice a little a little bit different. Now, this is this is phase one. This is phase one of the you know, of the, of the, the three phase program that you go through, but they get to start early because they have a new coaching staff. So it'll really just getting, getting everybody together uh, even before the draft class comes in and get them assimilated into the way this coaching staff wants to do things, how you're going to meet, how you're going to run practices, you know, what they expect of you in the building. All of it, all of it is new, even though you've got, a, you've got returning guys, you, you've added new pieces, and so the first part of it is just getting everybody uh, in lockstep on what you're on what you're doing. You know your the, your individual drills. You know how how you're gonna how you're gonna practice, how you're gonna meet. How you, I mean all of those things. It's even though there, it's similarities throughout all 32 clubs. There's differences and there's differences. And so what players like, what professionals like. Is, is, is they like they like a routine and they like to know you know what's coming next and so this is the first phase of that as getting these guys integrated into the way that Brian Callahan wants to run his show. Coach Dave McGinnis here with us on 104.5 The Zone. Check out the official Titans podcast where him, Mike Keith, Titans Amy, Rep Brian, uh, and a variety of different people talk all things Titans throughout the course of the offseason and get you ready for the upcoming NFL draft. By the way, Titans Radio doing three days of draft coverage. Uh, this year with a different kind of format. I know, Mac, uh, I was talking to Rhett in the parking lot on the way out the door. I know you guys are really excited about how that's going to look this year. Yeah, well, we're going to, you know, the first the first day will be will be live uh, down at the, you know, down at the stadium in the in the Wesley Mortgage Club with, uh, you know, with with a group. You know, it's got, I think it's going to be suite holders and ticket holders and, you know, and whatever, but there's a whole family thing going on on the field, and so it's going to be a it's going to be a pretty big production, and of course, we'll go live with all with all the picks. And then, and then on day two, and and then day three, you know, we will we'll take it to the to the studio, uh, up up there at, at, at Cumulus, and we'll be following everything. You know, the thing that, that that's uh, I think unique about this draft is, and again, this is the way it stands right now. Is after that top pick in the second round, you know, there's quite a few picks, and, until as as it's set right now as to when the the Titans the Titans pick. So we'll be doing 
we'll be covering what what's going on with the league and 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 kind of trying to to see in place once people start picking people as, as those uh, picks start progressing how it could affect the Titans you know on the on the on the third day of of what's going to go on so yeah we've got three full days of it we're getting ready to go deep into some OTPs here in the next week with uh with Amy and Mike and and Rhett and I and Ramon and just you know kind of put some things out there early on uh, before we get to it so it's an exciting time i mean this the the draft the draft encompasses a lot of different things but it really captures all the nfl fans it captures their interest and 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 rightfully so and so everybody's everybody is interested in what the titans are going to do in the draft and uh, we'll try to help with that a little how do you, how often do you reset your draft board throughout the course of the process mark constantly constantly I mean, you know, it, it's all, uh, you know, it, it's all, it, it's all a, a progression because, you, you know, you, you start in and it, it's like, it's, it's like taking the, you know, all of it in together and then you start parsing it out and then you start, you know, that's why we go to, that's why we go to the senior bowl. That's why we go to the, to the combine. And that's why I stay at the combine the whole week watching the players and then, you know, talking to people and, and then, and then what's very, very important because you know I don't go to pro days pro days anymore, but that's that's part of it. So now you know I'll get reports from the pro days to see, you know, you know what happened, especially with some guys that haven't been able for some reason or the other, or by choice, not working out at the combine or not participating in an in an all star game. So it's it's bits and pieces, and I mean it's always it's always changing. That's why that you know most teams don't even start really setting their final draft board probably starting this week. You know, because they're gathering so much information, and of course, you know they've got you know a big group of people that are bringing all kinds of information in. But uh, it, it's got to be a it's got to be a fluid process, and you've got to be. That's why your vertical and your horizontal board together are so so important, and uh, and that can change. That can change with a lot of things that 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 go on, and so uh, it's constantly changing. It's not drastic changes, but sooner or later, you can only pick one person. One person, you know, per per choice when the rounds come around, and so you've got to you've got to take a lot of information and try to zero it in on that one point in time when it happens when you're on the clock. Uh, as a man of very simple fashion taste and typically one kind of color tone, every time I see you, what did Mike Keith wear better, Calvin Ridley's chain or Legarius Sneed's jacket? I thought I thought the combination would be great. I, mean, I would like to see him with. The jacket and the chain on because Mike Keith, Mike Keith could pull it off. I mean, he did. He he, he, he did pulled pull it, off. it off a little bit, didn't he? <laughs> no, no, completely. You know, Mike Keith is 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 multifaceted human being. You know, people just if they just know him from his, from his voice, listening to him. When you're around him, I mean, this is a this is a this is a very very layered dude. He understands. He can he can fit in anywhere. He's a Renaissance man. I thought he looked great. I agree. Coach Dave McGinnis always <laughs> here with us, making things great, keeping it real, keeping our powder dry, and chopping it up on the OTP, the official Titans podcast, available wherever you get your podcast. His visit with us today and always presented by Two Rivers Ford. Mac, thank you so much, and I'll see you out there on the 10th, it sounds like. Yeah, Buck, and it's good. It's good, and, and, and do not, do not. Stare at the eclipse with no glasses. Put the glasses on, Buck. Tammy's providing them. Use them. <laughs> I all I heard is two thousand dollars instead of one thousand dollars to look into the eclipse. But I appreciate the guide smack. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> you can't fix stupid. A wise man once said. It's the first time in my life that I've ever disagreed with Coach Mac. I think you should look into the eclipse. <laughs> I'm going to slip you a you, pair of fake sunglasses. You know that I can still do this job without my eyesight. Like, blinding me for your own personal gain is not going to benefit you. I completely disagree. I completely disagree. You're so obsessed with where the camera is and how things look that uh, yeah. I could I could, I could, could have a field day. I could tell you the camera's over there and have you turn around so it's just the back of your head. It would, there are, The possibilities are endless. You, <laughs> the idea that you would torment a blind person. <laughs> You're sick. You're sick. I'm sorry I hurt you. 615-737-1045 is the number. Uh, Jameson says, just don't pull a Trump and just squint or pull a Trump and just squint your eyes at it. Has he done that? I think if you squint enough, then it'll filter the UV enough to where it won't 
permanently damage your no, vision. No, you do not have Donnie out here trying to squint through the eclipse. You don't remember that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Google it. Can we please, since we're getting ready to all suffer through whatever the hell the election cycle is going to be, can we please use some Trump and Biden drops? Is that, are you so uncomfortable with that? No, no, I'm into it. Because all I want to do is be able to figure out a way to tee up, I did everything in right and they indicted they me. Indicted me. <laughs> no, we're going to have plenty. We're going to have plenty of material from both of those guys oh in, my the, God. in the coming months. Please. Just to, just to keep it light. Both sides. We're, we're playing both sides here. I'm all in. 615-737-1045. G. G Soli on the FNM Bank chat says, Buck's not blind. He wore that on purpose. <laughs> this is the only thing Preds colors that I have. And also, I like my Rowdy Lou. You're out of your mind. This is very, very comfortable. Bert came in here and said, now Bert's fashion taste is not something that anybody should aspire to. But he came in here and said, every time you wear that, I wonder where you get it because it looks so cool. And Bert never says anything nice to me about what I wear. Bert's fashion taste is consistent. It's the most consistent of anyone I know, maybe apart from Coach Mac. It's yeah, Coach Mac wears the same. Yes. I just, just imagine a giant closet full enormous, of the same enormous black palatial closet shirts and black jeans with occasionally a black pullover. Yep. Yep. The man in black. Uh, Bert's style is consistently thrift shop. When he and I did a little, uh, we did a little Christmas shopping together in December. Uh, made a couple of stops. Antiquing. I had, to, I had to do some Christmas shopping. I asked if he wanted to come along, and he did. And we went. I want to send a promo person along on you and Bert's <laughs> adventures. Well, we went to uh, a shoe store that will remain unnamed until they sponsor the show. <laughs> and they had a deal going. It was like, buy a pair, get a pair 50% off. And I bought a pair for my sister for her Christmas gift. I got myself a nice pair of shoes. You would buy your sister shoes? That's what she wanted. Oh, I don't trust myself enough. She to... sent me a very specific, oh, okay. like, I want these Nikes. But yeah. Anyway, uh, Robert took advantage of the same deal, but he left with two pairs of Crocs. <laughs> two different pairs. One, like, normal pair of Crocs that, that when you think Crocs, what you're picturing is what he had. The other <laughs> was like... Some sort of Crocs, like, I don't know, like, nice Cole Haan sort of hybrid where it's... Cole Haan Crocs? It's, it's like a Croc that you would wear to a formal event, but oh still God. very much Croc. Still had the holes and everything. So the man, if anything, is consistent, and I respect him. Coming up next, what in sports gave you the feel good? What do we have for people to win if they give us their Friday fire this week, Lucas? We have a family four-pack of tickets to see Monster Energy AMA Supercross Championship at Nissan Stadium April 20th, thanks to our window nation ticket window, 615-737-1045. The only way to win is if you have the best submission for Friday Fire, the most positive story you saw in sports this week. Real simple. 615-737-1045. Before that, we'll give you our Friday Fire next. Below MSRP. Below MSRP. Below MSRP. It's pretty simple. Two River Sports sells all new non-specialty Fords below MSRP. Mortgage professionals in Middle Tennessee. Hi, I'm Chuck McDowell, owner of Wesley Mortgage. I'm a true local, born in Mount Juliet, met my wife at MTSU, and I live in Franklin. While every other mortgage company is cutting back, we're rapidly expanding and investing. Are you sick of feeling like an operations employee to ensure your loans are closed on time? When you look around your office, it doesn't look the same. You're missing people. You're missing your friends. Is anyone having fun? We're having fun every day. As the official mortgage provider of the Tennessee Titans, I've personally recruited the top local operations team to ensure your loans are closed on time. So you get paid. So you get to spend time building your business and you get to have fun at work again. Now is the time to join our team to start a confidential conversation with our local president and COO. Visit whywesley.com, whywesley.com. The guaranteed offer is the easiest way to sell your home. It's really simple. We bring you an all cash offer, you close in as little as 21 days, no home inspections, no lockboxes, 
no open houses. Go to MarkSpain.com to get a guaranteed offer and start packing. All right, I've found the Trump picture. <laughs> it's it might be my Friday fire. I can't believe you never you can't be your Friday fire. It's from seven years ago. It doesn't matter. We got an eclipse coming up on Monday. We're gonna be out at Two Rivers Ford. 
All four shows broadcasting live. Come out to hang out with us. We're going to have giveaways. They've got special eclipse classes, of which the 45th president of the United States is not wearing. If we're going to do this again, Trump, Biden, for the election, if we're going to do this again, then let's just have them have a squint off. And the winner, whoever flinches first during the eclipse, gets to be the next president of the United States. Oh, my God. Look at him. (laughs) It's just the fate. The facial expressions of this man, I I would put them in the Louvre. I would hang them as as a series next to the Mona Lisa. (laughs) All right. Play the music. Buck Rising is one of the least positive people on the planet. So to combat that, we've installed a new segment where he's forced to be positive. This is Friday Fire. Because it's Friday, you ain't got no job, and you ain't got shit to do. For the opportunity to win what, Lucas, if people call in 615-737-1045 and give us their Friday fire right after we give you ours, what can they win? The best submission for a moment of positivity in sports this week is a will win a family four-pack of tickets to see Monster Energy's AMA Supercross Championship at Nissan Stadium April 20th, thanks to our Window Nation ticket window. Love to see it. 615-737-1045. All you have to do is call in and give us your Friday Fire, the thing in sports that gave you a little feel-good this week. Some positivity. Nothing wrong with a little positivity. Uh, Mine was just uh, hanging out with our buddy Landon yesterday. Lucas, that video that you took of us uh, dancing along with him to talk about SEC is one of the most heartwarming things I think. I just I kept watching it over and over yesterday, just smiling. How happy he was! I love that. That's his favorite song. I know, just his head bobbing. It was awesome. It was uh, that whole that whole hour that we spent with Ashley and Landon yesterday. Uh, really, really put me in a great mood. It kind of you know every once in a while you need something to restore your faith in humanity. Just generally, especially as we talk about an election cycle coming up, and uh, hanging out with Landon, the toughest Titan, like his T-shirt said. Yesterday, and his mom Ashley was kind enough to bring him in studio and hang out with us for an hour. Uh, that was my Friday fire. If it's if I can't choose the Trump picture from 2017, <laughs> I will go with Landon. Are you familiar with Roll Tide Willie? Yes. Don't give a piss about nothing but the tide. Nothing but the tide. Blitz, Bama, Blitz. With right. This, He's gone viral. This Alabama Rost ass eyes. Yes. Uh, my Friday fire is the fact that Alabama head coach Kalen DeBoer. Brought in Roll Tide Willie saw. to do his whole bit in front of the team. And even Alabama defensive coordinator Kane Womack allowing Roll Tide Willie to call a play during practice. Hey, what are we rolling with right here? What you want? Black Mama Blitz! Black Mama Blitz! All right, damn right. I got, got you right. Blitz Bama Blitz. All right. Just unhinged. Yes. <laughs> uh, now, the reason this is my Friday fire is because... I guess maybe I'm still living in this world of denial uh, that the bad man Nick Saban can't hurt me anymore. No, I wouldn't be so sure. He's he's still tinkering in the background of college sports. He may just do something. It still felt too good to be true, though, that Nick Saban is no longer the head coach for Alabama. I think this is the crystallizing moment for me. The fact that Roll Tide Willie (laughs) in Alabama is doing gimmicky stuff like bringing Roll Tide Willie in to talk to the team. I looked at that. Not Bill Belichick. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not exactly. It's roll tide. Not Bill Belichick. Willie, kids. Not Steve Kerr. Not <laughs> Michael Jordan. Or right. Like President Obama or right. something like that. Nope. Roll tide Willie. <laughs> and I see that and I say, oh yeah, no, Nick Saban is definitely not the coach at Alabama anymore. If that's what's happening. Incredible. That's a Butch Jones move. G. Sully right says, there. oh, what did you just do to Kalen DeBoer? Now, look. Look at you getting chesty. Kalen DeBoer is a fantastic head coach. You just compared him to Butch. Alabama. No, I said that is a Butch move. That gimmicky type of stuff. Bring in the viral Alabama fan to come and make the team laugh, which is fine. But it just crystallized for me. Nick Saban really is gone. He really can't hurt me anymore. And Alabama is still going to be a very good football team under Kalen DeBoer because he's a great coach and he's assembled a good staff, even though he's had to wade through, you know, some turbulence and some of those guys getting poached here and there, like Ryan Grubb to Seattle, William Inge to Tennessee. But, but he's not Nick Saban and it has never felt more real than watching Roll Tide Willie scream Blitz Bama Blitz to the entire team at spring practice. Somebody in the chat says we got to stop making people like that famous. (laughs) That's my Friday fire.
Okay, for the opportunity to win a family four-pack to some motocross action at Nissan Stadium, 615-737-1045 is how you give us your Friday fire. Let's start with Kyle in Kalioka. Hey, guys. Uh, Buck, you 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 nailed it. Just seeing Landon have a good time and enjoying being in the studio, that really did it for me. That's, I'll never forget that. But uh, my best thing in sports, the LSU-Iowa game, I, it did so much for women's sports. And I had my wife, who's not too much of a sports fan, I heard her I heard her screaming, come on, Reese, get back in the game. Clark, get in the head. Just, I mean, I had her going. And I was like, hey, if I can get her going, this has got to get a lot of other women, hopefully men, realizing that women's sports are good too. Actually, I think women are better at basketball. Men are just better athletes. That's that's it. I appreciate the call, Kyle. Hey, stay on hold uh, when you give your submission so Lucas can contact you about the uh, tickets. I, LSU-Iowa is a tough, like, sports moment to to beat. And and what it has done for women's sports. I, I love that we have so now normalized women's college basketball as a part of the entertainment sports cycle that it's uh, that Angel Reese's post-game press conference is being debated on first take. That's how that's how you know that women's basketball has made it. Once it's made the first the first take debate desk rundown, God help us. Welcome to the show. Uh Jake in Union City next. Mine is uh it didn't happen this week, but I just saw it this week. It's the Ridley OTP. Uh, podcast that that's really good oh with him uh him getting a little dusty with mike keith yeah that was that was really really good stuff oh you know what my friday fire off of that was what? mike keith seamlessly transitioning into a dunkin donuts race. oh seat geek <laughs> seat geeks <laughs> just breaks a man all the way down in in tears about a, an emotional moment that they have done well to prepare and then tells you about seat geek the official ticketing partner of the tennessee titans they showed calvin a video from when mike interviewed him when he was a draft prospect and talking about just wanting to take care of his mom and and all of it. and he looked so different too he had braces and short hair and, yeah and so it was really cool to see calvin go through those emotions uh, let's see one more. Jason in Murfreesboro. Hey guys, how y'all doing? Good. Uh, I, I would say my Friday fire, man. Just listening to you guys talking about it today, and then just uh, the past few weeks is the Fred and uh, Philip Forsberg, man. Just how he became this is the best year ever for his career, and the Fred, you know, making this run. That's my Friday fire. It's pretty good. Appreciate the call, Jason. All right, uh, Lucas will decide who to give the tickets to during the commercial break. Coming up next, we'll talk about my favorite offensive line prospects in the draft. So hang with us here for the final hour on 104.5 The Zone.
It is 12.01. Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Panzeca from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. The Nashville Predators head northeast for a two-game road trip after a 6-3 to win over St. Louis last night at Bridgestone. Philip Forsberg scoring two goals and an assist. His 43rd goal ties a career high and a single-season franchise record. They are at the Islanders tomorrow at 6.30 at the Devils Sunday at 6. The Titans with number changes, including some incoming free agents. Calvin Ridley will still wear zero. Sneed will still wear 38. And Lloyd Cushenberry will wear 79. Running back Tajay Spears is changing to two. Linebacker Kenneth Murray changing to 56. And offensive lineman Jalen Duncan will change to 71. In NFL news, Panthers defensive tackle Derek Brown is signing a four-year, $96 million extension that includes over $63 million guaranteed. And the final four is this weekend on the men's and women's side, starting with the women in Cleveland. NC State and South Carolina tip off at 6. UConn and Iowa start at 8. The men's final four is in Phoenix on Saturday. NC State and Purdue start at 5.09, followed by UConn and Bama at 7.49. You can hear the Westwood One call of both the men's games here on the zone presented by Old South Properties and Farm Bureau Health Plans. Nashville Soccer Club is back home Saturday night. They host Philadelphia Union at Geodas Park. Kickoff is at 7.30. Pre-game coverage starts at 7. You can hear the radio call on the 104.5 The Zone app by selecting the Nashville SC live stream or by watching on Apple TV with the option of turning on the home radio broadcast audio. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. So many offensive line prospects, so many off-seasons talking about offensive line prospects. We are 20 days away from potentially having that burden removed from us. We know the Titans have obvious needs. We know that this draft sets up very well for them. So is the path through the Titans draft as obvious as any team out there? And who are your favorite offensive line prospects? Tackles, guards, maybe even a center? Depending on how you feel about developmental type of things, depth is at a premium right now for this particular team. and doesn't mean that they can't add additional pieces in the post-draft free agency. But as we started the show with, Joe Alt visited the Titans on Wednesday as one of his 30 visits. I don't know that besides Caleb Williams to the Bears, there's a more obvious or more regularly mocked pick and player than Joe Alt to the Titans at seven. Does feel a little bit inevitable that way. No, we'll find out 20 days from now what they end up doing with number seven overall. And in the meantime, it's not like they just have tackle needs, and we haven't really done a ton of draft preview around here, but I figure now is a good a time as any to start. Do you have a favorite offensive line prospect generally? Is there somebody you watch, somebody you know from college who may not be, you know, the the same five names at the top of this list that we've been cycling through? Is there a particular offensive lineman in this draft that you enjoy watching? It's alt because from the beginning of one of the Titans to address left tackle at seven and from the beginning of heard Ramon Foster talk about what he likes about Joe Alt and the way Ramon has divvied it up between Alt and Fashionu, which it felt like we spent weeks and weeks as that that's 1A, 1B, right? However you want to divvy it up, alt fashion And have we moved to no Joe Alt is the clear-cut number one left tackle in this draft? With with fashion kind of seems like it slipping down a little bit. Because Ramon had been consistent on that, and I loved the metaphor that he had used on Joe Alt is a blanket. Fashion is a wall. So Alt. Yes, some of the issues that Greg Cosell talks about, that he gets too wide, he has some issues with his hands, but at the end of the day, he gets the job done. Whether he's just smothering a guy or using his length and his size to his advantage more than setting his base and using that like Fashionu does. 
I just think Joe Alt is the guy that can get the job done, that has more tools to get the job done, and paired with Bill Callahan could be something special. So I'm not going to overthink it and look at a fourth-round guy, uh, look at a, a Patrick Paul out of Houston. I'm just going to say the best left tackle in the draft, and that's Joe Alt, because that's who I want the Titans to take at seven. Because the second-best tackle prospect in the draft is not a left tackle. He's a right tackle. Mims. No, Fuaga. Fuaga. The Talisi Fuaga at Oregon State, he has the footwork and the athleticism to play both sides. He is a right tackle by trade, but from most coaches that you talk to, talking to a bunch of people at the Combine, doing these shows with Greg over the course of the last couple of months, Fuaga is somebody who's going to be regarded as either a right or a left tackle at the next level. It just depends on the need of the team that ends up drafting him. He is, his length is not elite, but the foot, the the footwork, the technique, the hand fighting, he seems to have good IQ from people that you talk, talk to uh, who have vetted these prospects a little closer. Seems to be right up there at the top of the list as far as just pure power and strength. So you probably go Fuaga and then Faltanu before you get to Olafashanu. Um, out of Penn State, I think depending on, and again, it depends on which teams you're talking to. Some some may feel differently about Fashanu than Fuaga or a lot of Fs, a lot of complicated F last names. But still, I think he's probably the best. If we're talking pure tackles, not just left tackles, because this team needs both, and you have, you have great pass rushers on both sides. You're just talking about protecting the quarterback's blind side first and foremost, and that being a particularly sore spot for this team basically since Lawan's Last, I mean, basically since 2020, they've been trying to figure this out. When Lawan tore his ACL, what, six year, six weeks into the season? Week six, week five? Would you feel good about taking a guy who has primarily played right tackle to kick out to the left? Yeah, if I'm, if the Bill Callahan is in fact all, O-line Jesus, sign me up. I, I'm inclined to, wh- whoever that guy wants, go get him. <laughs> whoever that guy wants, you tell us, Bill Callahan, who is the player that we should be taking and where should we be comfortable taking them? Just defer to the experts. If this is, in fact, as collaborative an experience as they seem to want it, even if I think I know everything about the offensive line group coming out, if I'm Chad Brinker or Rand Carthon or Anthony Robinson, I'm just going to, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm going to turn around in the draft room to Bill Callahan and say, hey, Bill, what, what are we doing here, stud? Let me know. Say the word. Who do you want? Uh, I think we have a sample size that that quote-unquote collaborative process has played into free agency, right? With the amount of Denard Wilson connections or even Tyke Tolbert at wide receiver, uh, Nick Holtz with Calvin Ridley. Like, I feel like we can confidently say that those conversations within the coaching staff have led to some of these moves in free oh, yeah. agency. Oh, Sneed. If you want to talk about why they stuck, not not the only reason they stayed in it, as long as they did for Snead. But Brian Callahan thinks he's one of the best quarters in football. Well, of course, the head coach will have input. I'm talking about the assistants, like what we're discussing with Bill Callahan. Yeah. No, it seems like they've been very, not outright deferential, but, you know, the C word. It continues to uh, just smother everything that this franchise and apparently every other franchise in professional sports does. But I think of all the the offensive linemen, and again, I'm cheating here. I'm I'm not going to pretend with you guys that I'm some kind of offensive line scout. Okay, I lean heavily on Greg. I try to talk to as many coaches as humanly possible. Um, I know Ben Jones has been working with a lot of these prospects in the in the draft coming up as interior guys, and somebody, a, a guy named Brandon Thorne, who has his own Substack who does in-person or rather Zoom interviews with each prospect and watches their own film with them, I cheat a lot and use Brandon Thorne as a resource because it's just the most streamlined way to help me understand what I'm supposed to be looking for in an offensive lineman because I'm not going to pretend that I'm some kind of expert. The more that I watch and talk to people, though, the player that has most made me want to go and seek out his tape independently of just these YouTube videos and stuff like that, where there's favorable plays being broken down. Jackson powers Johnson, the center at Oregon is an absolute just front end loader of a human being. 
and I know the Titans don't need a starting center right now with Lloyd Cushenberry, but I'm just talking about my favorite prospect to watch that's make, made me seek out additional games is the Oregon center. And to uh, to talk to Greg Cosell about some interior offensive line prospects yesterday, we spent a little time focused on Powers Johnson. Yeah, I mean, he he plays a, a strong man's game. I mean, that's that's what he really is. He has strong, powerful, heavy hands, and he moved people. Um, you know, he's he's he packed a, a short, quick, compact, yet really powerful punch. It very often changed the path of pass rushers, and he was able to maintain his balance and a strong base. Um, you know, I think that's his game. Uh, he's not a bad athlete, Buck, but he's not – the best athlete you'll see at the center position um i'll be really curious to see you know where he gets drafted um you never know with centers um but you know he's got strength he's got power he certainly has more than functional athletic movement and there's a high level of competitive toughness i mean you 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 want a guy on your offensive line who plays you know with an attitude who's nasty who finishes who sets a tone that's what this guy does. I mean, he's he's that kind of player. He finishes with an edge. Um, there's a swagger to him. That's what you want with your offensive line. The way he finishes some of these blocks when you watch him against, and, you know, we've talked about this during the course of the college football season, Lucas, but it's just such a shame that the Pac-12 had the kind of season that it did only to be uh, sledgehammered to death this offseason. Um, because... The games for Oregon, watching their offensive line against like Utah, for example, or Washington, and seeing the way that Powers Johnson finishes some of these blocks against some of the better defensive linemen in college football last year and some of the better defenses in college football last year. He'll he'll run over a guy, block them, block him through the whistle, then just roll over. He he has a tendency to kind of like front end roll to look athletic afterwards as he finishes these blocks and then just gets up and stands over a bunch of these dudes. I love that meanness. Absolutely love it. And I know the Titans aren't in a market in the market for a starting set of this draft, but he's he's been one of my favorite ones to kind of watch a little more of. And a strong name. It's a good name. A strong name. Yes, indeed. Do you have a favorite? I, I told you. I'm not overthinking it. I'm not going to pretend like I'm an O-line guru. <laughs> I want the Titans to take Joe Alt. I'm sticking with Joe All at seven. I'm there I'm are not so, crunching tape over here. No, I know. And I'm listen, I'm not gonna act like I'm hardcore crunching tape, but I watch I need to watch enough so that I can not sound like an idiot when I talk to Greg. Basically is is my objective every draft season. Uh let's talk some college hoops. We got the final four in men's and women's. Most likely upset this weekend. Yukon on the men's side or South Carolina. On the women's side, we'll get into that coming up next.
Final Four in college hoops this weekend. I don't know which Final Four I'm more interested in. I probably equal levels of intrigue for me. I'd probably take my favorite game. It has it has to be between UConn and Alabama and Iowa and UConn from men's and women's respectively. Both of my favorite games this weekend sound like they're going to feature UConn. UConn and Iowa feels like the game that has has the most star power in it from the opportunity for, for two players who are name-brand commodities and Paige Beckers and Caitlin Clark to go toe-to-toe the same way that you kind of had with Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark in the uh, Elite Eight. But I'm not sure who has the bigger upset potential in this weekend between UConn men's or South Carolina women's. It's going to be a tough task for Alabama because UConn's defense has been their hallmark throughout the course of the tournament. Lucas and I talked about it earlier. They had a much, I don't want to say a much easier time than they, well, yeah, they had a much easier time getting through their side of the bracket than they could have had, for example, Auburn not choked on the first weekend. And uh, uh, Illinois uh, just posed more of a threat, any kind of a threat at all. Iowa State, obviously, uh, seeing their season ended in an earlier round. Now, with Alabama, you've got a team that can play play with pace, a team that will uh, turn the ball over to an extent, but will absolutely rain fire from three-point range and has been hot all March long. Will that carry into April for them? We'll find out certainly this weekend. I'm inclined to think that UConn men's has the bigger upset potential with Alabama than does South Carolina and Don Staley this weekend. I agree. I agree. South Carolina is just a machine right now. They just they just look unstoppable. And NC State's had a great run on the women's side and the men's side. But they they have looked like UConn men and South Carolina women have not just looked like the most unbeatable teams in their respective tournaments, but throughout the course of the regular season. South Carolina undefeated UConn men only with three losses, where the women looked pretty vulnerable early on. They had one of the worst starts to a regular season in Gino Ariema's tenure at UConn. And the way that they've gotten it right and... They kind of, they want a heavyweight matchup of their own against USC in the Elite Eight that took place after Iowa LSU. But you, you think, think Gino's vanity uh, is is bothered by the idea that he's not even remotely the biggest personality in women's college basketball anymore? Kim Mulkey stole that from him so fast. She definitely is the more notable coach, and the players absolutely are are bigger stars than he is right now. That yeah, doc- I wonder if that I wonder if that actually bothers. No, him. that's Gino is for sure the type. <laughs> Just everything that we know about Gino Ariema throughout the course of his history, like there, ha- there's probably a small part of him, maybe not even that small of part of him. I recognize vanity. I know vanity. All right, Gino Ar- Ariema is probably bothered by this. Do you think Gino, if the three point line debacle had happened, which it happened to NC State in Texas, right mm-hmm. in the women's Elite Eight game, if that had been UConn involved, do you think Gino would have said, "Bleep it, let's play"? No, no way, right? Not a chance. <laughs> yeah, no shot. Not a chance in hell. Now, to the men's side of things, Alabama and UConn this weekend, that's definitely the potential for the more fun game, though I think that Purdue has the bigger upset potential. I mean, by, by you know, who's favored? By Vegas odds, Purdue definitely has the bigger upset potential. But I just, I don't know how well, I don't really understand what that's going to look like between P- Purdue and NC State. Like, what truly is the answer for Zach Eady, and is DJ Burns enough just to be able to kind of hold ground against him in the post and things like that and stay out of foul trouble, which we don't know is going to go their way. But I think that um, I think that the more that I watch this stuff, my preferred final is UConn and Purdue, but for only one reason. I want to see Purdue make it to the championship game on Monday. And then Monday night, I want to watch Purdue lose the championship game. That would make me very happy. That the, the worst parts of sports fandom in me, that would be 
I know my basketball team doesn't do anything. I know they're useless at this particular point in time. I take no, I take no solace in that. It's there is there are four months suffering for no, me in my I'm, life. I'm relating to you right now. You want Purdue to win over NC State. You want them to get to the and not only get to the national championship game, but have hope in the national championship game. Yes. Not not get run off the floor like no. UConn's been I want, doing. I want them to emerge from this NC State game feeling good, feeling confident with a with a healthy margin of victory. I want them to. I want Zach Eady chesty. By yes. the time he gets to UConn and Monday night's national championship game. And then I want it to be ripped away from Shattered. Him. Just, well, yes. like, like a UNC Villanova type finish <laughs> from a few years ago. Oh, it would make me so <laughs> happy. Uh, so man. happy. Did you happen to watch the NIT championship last night? I did not. Uh, because this, you already had one version of this. You, you should wish that you had watched it because Indiana State lost in good heart-wrenching fashion. Good. I mean, they had their hearts, and I know it's the NIT. Bleep a sycamore. But Indiana State and Seton Hall both wanted to win that game, and it was an amazing game. I had the second half on during Preds intermission, and I watched the end before flipping back to the Preds after the second period started. But Indiana State had a healthy lead. They kind of stretched it out late in the second half, and then Seton Hall goes on a run. It's back and forth in the final moments. Seton Hall goes up two, and on the last possession... It is chaos. Indiana State is jacking up shots. They're getting offensive rebounds. They get a shot blocked. They get the deflection, get another three off, almost at the buzzer. Not quite, but it bounces off the rim, and then an Indiana State player comes in at the final moment and tries to kind of volleyball set it back up into the hoop at the buzzer and misses by that oh. much. Had an amazing look at it in what would have been a buzzer beater to send it to OT. So heart-wrenching loss for Indiana State. You got it in the NIT. And I understand why you want it in the national championship. If I were you, I would want the same thing. And maybe a lot of Tennessee fans want that too. They want Purdue to get to the natty and lose in heartbreaking fashion to UConn. Or maybe Tennessee fans are living vicariously through DJ Burns and they want to see Burns and NC State win that matchup and continue this run. What would mark, <laughs> what, 10 straight wins? Yeah. No, they've already won 10 straight. Have they? No, Could I'm sorry. It's nine straight. It's, it's nine, nine straight. straight, right. Five and five in the ACC and they've yeah. won four to get here. Yeah, but so what would what would Tennessee fans want more? The two scenarios that you've just painted. Purdue to lose in heartbreaking fashion in the national championship mm -hmm. or NC State or, to beat them yes, in the final four. Or DJ to get Tennessee's revenge over Purdue. Or to see Alabama advance past UConn and Ugh. then have it ripped away no, violently. No, no, I don't want that. From I'll, Alabama. I, I don't want that. I want Why? Alabama to lose. I want Alabama to get run off the floor by 40. Oh, you Saturday. don't want them to beat you. I don't even want them to to have that feather in their cap of being in a national championship game. I don't want it. It's heights that they have never reached. Like, Purdue has reached these heights before as a program. Look at you. I don't want it. You sound like a kid that doesn't want to eat their it. broccoli. No, I want I, I want UConn to do to Bama what they have done to every tournament team they've placed they've played within the last two years. And it, which is just basically shut them down. I mean, the defense has been suffocating from UConn. And I... I mean, I guess that could happen against Alabama, but they would have to have their worst, basically their worst shooting night of the tournament. Um, I don't know who the star of Saturday night is going to be necessarily because Zach Eady is always going to be polarizing. I mean, obviously, if DJ Burns and NC State are to advance, then he would become probably the focal point as an individual player of the national championship discussion. UConn will be the thing. Danny Hurley will be the the person, the polarizing figure that is most trafficked in because it's UConn has good players. Tristan Newton is a really high level player. I think that uh, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of talent to like about U UConn's team, but you talk about them more as a team than you do about than as independent players from one another. We're all all three of the other teams remaining in the field do seem to have that polarizing figure. I guess Sears isn't really polarizing. He's just a damn good he's basketball just a, yeah, player. Yeah, he's just a good player, and he leads the charge. But with Alabama, it's not about just Sears having to lift them. I mean, yes, he has to produce, but it's about the system for yeah. me with Alabama. And in some ways, Purdue, I understand how much of it revolves around Zach Eady, but Purdue has been so good at using Eady to their advantage to get looks on the outside, and it's the thing that Tennessee took away in the first game, and Edie destroyed them for it. So, yeah, DJ Burns is the example of that, like, because of how just noticeable he is. <laughs> uh, 
You can interact on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. You can also call the show, 615-737-1045. On YouTube, VolsFan336 says, How about pulling for Purdue and saying as a Vols fan, we got beat by the best? I hope Zach Eady ends up having one of the greatest tournament runs in history. Let me say a few things here, okay? It's a lovely sentiment. I really appreciate you bringing a degree of sportsmanship to the proceedings around here. And like Lucas, acting like a child and running away, pushing the broccoli off his plate, I'm going to tell you, I don't want it. I love right? broccoli. I I don't want it. I don't want Zach Eady to, to have anything nice. I've never pushed broccoli off my plate. I don't want Purdue to have anything nice. I am anti-sportsmanship. I want to see their dreams get crushed, okay? Not as a Tennessee fan, but because I hate Purdue. But we can be aligned. There have been multiple opportunities. Our hatred of Kentucky, it brings us closer together, okay? You and me. All right, we're right here together. We hate Kentucky. We like to see them lose. It's a very, very enjoyable experience. We are also with the rest of the country in that sentiment, it seems. Nobody likes to see Kentucky lose like the rest of the college basketball world. Secondarily, um, Zach Eady already is the two-time defending national player of the year. He is probably the most important Purdue basketball player in the history of a very, very proud proud program. Uh, and also, I want him to suffer. <laughs> not, not physically. I don't want anything bad to happen to him. <laughs> But uh, emotionally, I want there to be some trauma at the end. I want him to make it to the national championship, and I want his big, dumb, long face to lose at the end. That's how I feel about it. But you can have your sportsmanship. Derek on the FNM Bank chat says, I hope Edie and Purdue lose by 50 and then are crying all the way home. Yes, but not until Monday. But you can do this in basketball during the regular season, right, where a team that you beat, you want them to have success. You want your wins to look and your losses to look as good as possible when it comes to seeding and RPI and all of those things. But I agree. In the tournament, although I will say I took some solace, very little, but some, in two of Tennessee's tournament heartbreaks in the Rick Barnes era, Loyola Chicago in the second round, and FAU in the Sweet 16 last year, that both of those teams had Cinderella-type runs to the Final Four, where it was like, all right, we got got by the Cinderella. That's not true at all. You were one of the biggest Sister Jean haters I remember. I didn't know you then. What are you talking? This was eight years ago, yeah, seven your, your years ago. Your tweets still exist. We can, Wait, we, are you, look, we can we can bring up old tweets. Do it. Do it. Look up my name and Sister Jean. You will not see anything. Yeah, because you deleted them all. I'm, I'm making sure I don't You were flagged. <laughs> you were threatening a hundred year old nun. <laughs> that is defamatory. I won't I won't stand for this. What are you gonna go hire Kim Mulkey's lawyers? Relax back there. You don't know anything. You don't know squat, you stupid idiot. Oh, it's been so long, Bruce. How many people do you think get that joke from the very, very start of the show? That's like week one type of yeah, stuff. was at the very beginning. <laughs> Darker times. Um, now, to some NFL news, because there has been a little bit of NFL news, probably worth talking about. Uh, Jordan Mailata gets a three-year, $66 million deal to remain as the Philadelphia Eagles left tackle you just saw the huge contract that Derek Brown got from the Carolina Panthers uh the former Auburn defensive tackle stays home there have you seen the the price tags on interior defensive linemen lately Titans got Jeff Steele done at a good time it they seems. really really did uh Adam Schefter put this out a couple of excuse me Bill Barnwell put this out a couple of years ago so in just over the past year the defensive tackle market has exploded You've got Chris Jones, five years, 158.75 mil. Christian Wilkins, four years, 110. Justin Matabike, four years, 98. Quinn Williams, four years, 96. Derek Brown, four years, 96. Jeff Simmons, four years, 94. Deron Payne, Dexter Lawrence, Leonard Williams, Javon, Har Javon Hargrave, all uh, north of $84 million and all on either three- or four-year deals. So, yes, they did pay Jeff at the correct time. So glad to have that done sooner rather than later. And the the way that interior pressure, the premium has been placed on that. I, I saw Bill Barnwell of ESPN point this out. In 2014, the top 10 edge rushers made 44% more than the top 10 defensive tackles. 14 edge rushers were making $10 million plus million, but only four defensive tackles were. Now, the top 10 edge rushers make 6% more than the top 10 defensive tackles. 14 edge rushers make $20 million plus, and 10 defensive tackles do too. That's why you're seeing guards get $20 million a year. I was about to say, 
th- why does it feel like we still get worked up then about spending high draft picks on guards or giving big money to guards when those guys are tasked with stopping those big money guys on the other side? Quentin Nelson is not an anomaly. All right, he's now the standard. If you've got a cal- or a Zach Martin. If you've got a player that kind of caliber that can keep the pressure off your quarterback at the fastest route to the quarterback, then that is worth in the same way that we talk about the corner market getting inflated by wide receivers getting paid. The guys who are paid to stop these dudes or slow these dudes down get paid too as a result. I don't know that Skaronsky's a blue chip player, all right? That they took him 11th overall. But it makes me feel a hell of a lot better if I'm a Titans fan who had any quibbles with taking a guard 11th overall because you see how many guards got paid north of 20 this year, north of 15 this year, a ton. That is that is now going to be a premium position, and the league is adjusting. Quarterbacks getting rid of the ball faster than ever, negating those kind of pass rushers, trying to find ways to you know get the, get the flare passes out to the side, m- mitigate, get the big guys moving side to side, horizontally and try and wear them out a little bit with a lot of these screens and flare passes and things like that. There are shot plays occasionally, but they're just focused on trying to maximize the efficiency of their passing game and keep the quarterback upright. That's why a guy like Legereus Sneed is important because if you're going to find ways to negate the interior pass rush or as many ways as humanly possible, then having guys who are capable of being excellent in coverage is just as important at this particular time. Landon Dickerson became the highest paid guard in NFL history this offseason with uh, his $21 million average annual value. DeForest Buckner has tweeted, DT market crazy with the stock up emoji. Mm -hmm. Y'all better start teaching your kids to put their hand in the dirt. And uh, Ian Rappaport quoted it saying, Colts defensive tackle DeForest Buckner coming off one of his best seasons with a year left on his deal is watching an extension candidate. Honestly, for talking about draft prospects, like there is – There's been a legitimate problem in the imbalance between the better athletes as high school players and then as college players wanting to play defensive line as opposed to offensive line, right? Because that's how you get paid. Those are the bigger paydays. Edge rushers, now interior defensive linemen. The best way to get the market to shift back to a level of balance is to see those kind of contracts for offensive linemen. Left tackles have always been paid well. But it's not like your right tackle can stand to be markedly less athletic than your left tackle can. He's just tasked with the more important side, the blind side, unless you're Tua. Interior offensive linemen, the best way to get better athletes to play offensive line and improve the quality of offensive linemen coming out of college and in the draft process is mega money on the other side. $20 million a year is a great incentive. Speaking of defensive players, he is not a defensive tackle, but another free agent name is off the board in terms of pass rushing help. Kyle Van Noy's back in Baltimore. I saw that. Now Two he, year deal. He's getting up there in age, and the defense is changing, but not really because they just promoted from within. Well, he's 33, just turned 33, and he just had a career year in Baltimore. Mike McDonald gone. A lot of the pieces on that defense gone. Matt Abike back. Patrick Queen, a stealer. Uh, Denard Wilson, obviously, here in Tennessee as the defensive coordinator. I wouldn't have hated Kyle Van Noy reuniting with Wilson here. Yeah, it kind of comes back to that post-draft free agency for me. And Baltimore just got a, Baltimore just got ahead of it. And they have a few more needs to kind of shore up. Two years worth $9 million, according to Rap Sheet. Yeah, you can afford that. But are you going to spend that? We, we've mentioned Emmanuel Ogba's name a couple of times. There's obviously other pass rushers out there. But at this point, I would think, and I don't know that they're going to address anything in the next 20 days, but 20 days is a substantial period of time. I would think that there would be a veteran safety move before anything at this point if I'm Tennessee, uh, or at least trying to prioritize that, and then looking around after the draft process at, process and saying okay what edge guys what veteran edge guys can I get on a one or two year deal to kind of patchwork the rest of this thing together and improve my front last call for phone calls if you got them 615-737-1045 last call for phone calls for the week I'm Buck Rising it's 104.5 The Zone
Fun week of shows. Thanks for hanging out with us. Blaine and Mickey, 3HL, going to keep you entertained. Coming up next, make sure you stick around. Uh, the great Spotify drought of 2024 is over. Thanks to WizKid extraordinaire Will Bowling. We've gotten your complaints, uh, your questions, your comments, your concerns about why the show has not been appearing for the last week, a little more than a week, on Spotify. Uh, all the episodes, I believe, have repopulated over the course. So if you missed Legereus Sneed, if you missed Phil Forsberg, uh, Corey Curtis yelling at me about how wrong I was about Stefan Diggs yesterday, all of that available to you now on Spotify and will continue to be so. So thank you to Will. Might have some catching up to do. Yeah, I don't think don't don't listen to that much of the show. I mean, we appreciate that how or much. Do. I mean, you can. We appreciate it. We. I don't want to discourage you, but like that much of us condensed in one. You know, depending on how much time you're breaking it up over. Uh, I don't know. Or would, go to one zero four five the zones YouTube page and subscribe, where you can get some of the best segments week to week on demand. Indeed, you can do that. Uh, there's a cool story that I saw on the Tennessee and Molly Davis, the reporter for this. Um, there is a Nashville health clinic that is providing free dental services, diapers, and vaccines on Saturday, April the 20th through a partnership with the NFL alumni Tennessee chapter. Um, now, this is something that I know Blaine has been involved with in particular. I don't know if he is going to be at this event on April the 20th, but it's uh, Al Smith, Brad Hopkins, of course, B-Hop, uh, who you guys know from so many years here and then on the air here in the last couple of weeks and when one of us is out. Uh, D-Mace, Albert Hainsworth, Joey Kent, Neil O'Donnell, they're all going to be in attendance at this. And it's an uh, event that's meant to promote, uh, promote healthy lifestyles and access to health care for members of the Nashville community. They're doing it in North Nashville. Uh, it's the uh, St. Luke CME Church and the Tennessee SEAL program of Meharry Medical College that are operating in this. So if you're in the Buena Vista area, which is right around my neighborhood as well, uh, hope to see you out there, and it's a good opportunity for you to get some uh, free food. They've got exercise classes that are also going to be available for participants and music as well. Should be good. When's the last time you went to the dentist? I go pretty regularly. Um, I'm a once every six months guy. Okay. When's the last time you had a cavity? Um, it's been at least two years. The nerds gummy clusters got me. Mm. I love, I love those things. Was that a COVID thing? A COVID thing? Or no, COVID was four years ago at this point. Goodness. Yeah. COVID, COVID's a lifetime, four years, a lifetime ago. I didn't have a cavity until I was like 24 and I was pissed. I was so mad. I, I wanted to bat a thousand my entire life. That doesn't happen. Like cavities are normal, bud. It's, it's completely normal. I'm just happy that we're, we we live in, in this generation where, like, dental care is prioritized because I look at some of my, like, relatives. Like, I don't want to be one of these old people at the end of my life that can't keep all of the food in their mouths because their teeth have depreciated so poorly. Um, it scares me. It frightens me. It makes me not want to be around, like, great aunts and great uncles and things like that. You already don't want to be around those people. That's true. But watching them eat grossly does not help. Although, you know, we love our we love our elderly community. <laughs> you hang out with me and Bert. You're just trying to find excuses. Find excuse what are you oh, as like a justification for being what, grossed what, out by watching people eat? Correct. I'm just grossed out by the two of you generally. All the sounds that come out of you on a regular basis between the two of you, all the smells. It's really disorienting. Polls, please. I don't know who you are, but I know what it's time for. A poll update on the Buck Rising show. Here's a young man with a very particular set of skills. With the final numbers, here's Buck Rising Show correspondent and producer, Lucas Panzica. Presented by Two Rivers Ford, the South's most trusted Ford dealer. Who is your favorite offensive line prospect in the 2024 draft class? Karen Bustin, they all say Joe Alt. Um, sure. If you're a Titans fan and you want to tackle... Why wouldn't you be in love with Joe Alt? He's, he looks like he can easily be a solution for any NFL team that adds him on the left side for, you know, hopefully a decade to come. What is your Friday fire? The most positive story that you saw in sports this week. A lot of love for Landon coming in studio yeah. yesterday for an hour. That was, uh, it made our day as much as anybody's. But Kenneth says the women's Iowa versus LSU game 
drawing the crowd that it did. Goody says the possibility of you getting replaced by Landon is his Friday fire. And Rick says the Preds puck drop last night. That little girl was the best puck dropper. Did you see that? I did. She yeah. wouldn't let go of the puck. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. meant to ask Forsberg about it. I go, what <laughs> happens if she won't let go of the puck? Can you not we start the game? Everybody go home. <laughs> What is your favorite Philip Forsberg goal of the season? Karen says all of them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 43 of them to pick from. It's not bad. Who is more likely to get upset this weekend, the UConn men or the South Carolina women? 54% say the South Carolina women. I have to disagree personally. I am aligned with you there. I would disagree on that. I think, I think South Carolina's got the far easier path to the national championship than does UConn. Is South Carolina the more dominant team in their respective sport than the UConn men? Mm. Have they been this year? I mean, by the, margin the numbers, of victory, not by UConn, margin of victory. UConn would take that from South Carolina because, well, like for example, the South Carolina Indiana game in the Elite Eight, they ran them out of the gym in the first half, and then Indiana did well to to fight back. Ultimately, came up short, but still uh, made. I think it was a five point uh, difference at the end of the game. Um, UConn has not allowed a team to score more than 60. Hell, they might not have given up more than 50 this year. UConn's definitely been more of just an absolute death star in the tournament, but that zero in the loss column for the South Carolina women. Pretty nice. That's crazy. Has that happened on the women's side? Surely UConn, at one point or another, just ran the table from start to finish. I it would... has not happened on the men's, right, because Kentucky was that close. No, and they lost has. to Wisconsin. You know who the last team to do it. On the men's side? Who? Mm-hmm. Indiana. When, when did Indiana go undefeated? Bob Knight in the 70s. Wow, I did not know that that was a thing. I remember Kentucky being that close. A lot, yeah, because Wisconsin, uh, oh, who's that big, ugly, lumberjack-looking dude? Frank uh, oh, Frank the Tank. Oh, What's Frank's name? Oh, it's going to I think he's still me. in the league. I think he is. He oh, got somebody. drafted by the Hornets because Michael Jordan kept drafting giant white dudes that look like Cody Zeller. Frank what? Kaminsky. Kaminsky. Frank Kaminsky. How many people were just yelling at their car? A radio. menace. An absolute college basketball menace. Um, that yes. was one of the more, you talk about being satisfied by your rivals, having heartbreak. That's up there. <laughs> Kentucky, what were they, like 39-0? Yeah. When, when that was Carl Anthony Towns, right? In the right? Final Four. Yeah. Oh, that's up there with one of the more satisfying losses by a rival in my life. Yeah, I'm like I'm like the Miami Dolphins that uh, toast, uh, do a champagne toast every time an NFL team loses an undefeated season. Uh, the 1975 Indiana Hoosiers. It's the last thing that I have to cling to, and it happened 40 years before I was born. But we are standing on... UConn men more likely to get upset by Alabama than the UConn women by NC State? I think so. I think if if you had to look at a potential for how those two teams play their respective games, and I'm not going to pretend to know everything about NC State women's basketball, but Alabama, with the way that they just shell teams from three, it's going to give them an opportunity to be in every game. Nine times there has been an undefeated champion in women's college basketball Four programs have done it. I should know this because Tennessee is one of them, as is Texas, Baylor, and UConn. The first to pull it off was Texas in the mid-80s. South Carolina trying to become the fifth program to ever do it. Okay. Those are the polls. Excellent. That's the show. That's this week for us. We appreciate you guys hanging out. Uh, We will be back at it. Well, the next time I talk to you will be Sunday night on the primetime show. But, of course, we'll have Casey Alexander in here to react to the Final Four and Break down the national championship. We'll be broadcasting live at Two Rivers. So come hang out with us in Mount Juliet. All four shows will be there. So even if you don't want to see me, you can see Ramon. You can see Blaine. You can see Slay. All the uh, all the zone personalities. Even Robert. They're going to let Robert out of the cage and go to Mount Juliet. God help us for the eclipse. I bet he looks directly into it. What happened to the music? Show's over. See you guys Monday.